say that I have any special attachment to this Scooby-Doo franchise. It wasn't a show I dreaded seeing, but it was just one of those cartoons you watch with a sort of baseline interest while you waited for something better to play because you're 12 and what else do you have going on in your life? So I've seen the 1969 show, I've seen a fair share of the various movies, I saw some of 13 Ghosts which I didn't like, I saw snippets of that weird crossover show they did with the Harlem Globetrotters or something? I don't know, the 70s were weird. It was all pretty much filler content for me as a kid. The only Scooby-Doo that really managed to get any interest from me was, of course, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, which is rightfully touted as one of the best Scooby-Doo movies. At some point the live action movies happened, but the thing I liked most about those was the joke in Looney Tunes back in action. You made me sound like a total space cadet, man! I'm sorry if you're the way I was, I was trying to be real to your character. If you like goof on me in the sequel, I'm coming after you! Yeah, and I'll give you a Scooby smack! So yeah, not exactly a personal favorite. But like most people who are into cartoons, you also can't deny that Scooby-Doo has a place of constant in life. The show launched in 1969 and between that and 2023, there has never been any real point of hiatus for the franchise. However, the franchise might have been around for 50 years, but the characters and tone have had several interpretations and changes made to them just by having existed for as long as they have. So when I saw that the new Velma cartoon had shuffled around character ethnicities and played a little with their personalities and was going to go for a more mature tone, I didn't see it as some grave offense or anything. At some point in my live streams, people started asking me what my opinions on the new Velma show was. At this point, I had heard mutterings about a lesbian Velma show and assumed people were blowing things out of proportion because a version of Scooby-Doo dared to go the dreaded book content route. So I hadn't looked into it too closely. As a result, when they were asking me about this, I thought people were talking about the other lesbian Velma cartoon that had just come out. And as promised, here are your Scooby Snacks. So I didn't think there was much to say other than it was weird to see the classic designs animated with such fluidity. And then I started seeing thumbnails. A lot of thumbnails. And it hit me that, oh no, oh no, there was another Velma cartoon that was getting people bent out of shape. And yet I still didn't think much of it until one specific live stream. I did, I did make, make a video, video on Velma, only saw one episode. My opinion is way, way, oh, way worse, worse than High Guardian, Guardian Spice? Spice? Are, Are you joking? joking? Okay, I thought. So, we have another cartoon trying hard to have positive representation and, for whatever reason, missed the mark rather spectacularly. I had started my Disney ranking series, which is still going, don't worry, but Velma had been mentioned by people in my chat and in comments enough for me to know there was a demand to hear what I had to say. So I thought, Okay, I'll give it a shot. After all, I just finished High Guardian Spice. How bad can it be? This is my story. And it starts with a murder, bitch. I have spent the last week trying my best to figure out what it is about this show which makes it so very broken. First things first, it's not the fact that it has queer representation or that it uses American social issues as fodder for its jokes. Like, that in of itself is not a problem. Listen, I'm from South Africa. In South Africa there is no such thing as too soon when it comes to humor. 
making fun of events and situations which in the real world are very much life and death serious is a crucial part of humanity's ability to cope. I am not being hyperbolic when I say this has been a part of human culture spanning literally thousands of years. Now I could go into an in-depth discussion regarding the power of humor when dealing with the horrors, but Roger Rabbit really did put it best. A laugh can be a very powerful thing. Why, sometimes in life, it's the only weapon we have. So Velma is not bad because it uses American social issues as a basis for jokes. After all, there is a strong history of TV shows and even animated TV shows that satirize serious events. So it's a form of comedy that's already proven itself to work. Another criticism I heard was that people just hate every single character in the show because they are also horribly unlikable. And that sounds like a good reason as to why a show would be bad if it wasn't for the fact that everyone in this show is a terrible person also has a strong history of not only being successful but being a cultural cornerstone on a global scale. Not only can you point at shows like Always Sunny, Curb Your Enthusiasm or the OG that is Seinfeld, but pretty much the entirety of British humour is based on the foundation of unpleasant people who are stuck together, but who still manage to have a strong sense of humanity to them. So even though as the audience are fully aware of the fact that these people kind of suck, you find yourself not only laughing at them when they make their own lives miserable, but you also find them, to your horror, to be relatable when things go wrong. I hear you're a racist now, father. <laughs> what? What? How did you get interested in that type of thing? Should we all be racist now? What's the official line the church is taking on this? Oh, no. Only the farm takes up most of the day and at night I just like a cup of tea. So Velma isn't bad because its characters are unlikable. Okay, so what is it then? Why is it that this show is just so incredibly bone searingly painful to sit through for any period of time? And after thinking it over and sitting through every episode more than once, the answer finally hit me. It's not funny. It's not funny. And the problem is, that sounds like a dismissive and simplified reason to hand wave away this show's problems. But no, the simple answer is, this show isn't funny. But the only way I can really explain why this is such a big issue is to try and relay the experience to you. You see, if this show wasn't funny due to some specific reason, I could talk in depth about the reason. But there is no one easy reason. The reason itself is, it's not funny. And because it's not funny, it means every single unlikable thing about it is exactly as unlikable as it presents itself because there is no humor to make it entertaining. In the world of so bad it's good content, there is a golden rule. Any genre can make for a fantastic movie experience if the film is exceptionally bad. Except for comedy. If a horror or a drama or an action movie or an art film or a sci-fi film or any other genre fails at what it sets out to do, they become comedic. <laughs> but when a comedy fails, it means it fails at being comedic. And when a comedy is bad at comedy, it leaves the audience with nothing. This is supposed to be a movie for kids. God! <laughs> and so here we are, at the threshold of this series, and me, your long-suffering curator of crap, ready to take you on a grueling and painful journey of describing the events of this show in a desperate attempt to make you understand just how bad not funny can get. Episode 1 starts with Velma giving us the setup of the show in a voiceover. Sure. Normally, origin stories are about tall, handsome guys struggling with the burden of being handed even more power. And if they are about girls, it's usually like, hey, what made this hot chick go crazy? Yeah, it was me, not Fred and his weird sex fan. This is my story told my way. 
And it starts with a murder, bitch. We are 56 seconds into the first episode, and it was right here that I started questioning if watching this any further was a good idea. If you haven't seen this show and that opening made you feel like your skeleton was going to hatch out of your body, this is your warning, because it's all downhill from here. The episode proper starts with some of the high school's popular girls taking a shower and talking about how they find it very sexist how a lot of teen dramas start their pilots with a shower scene. This is followed by one of the girls commenting that she kind of likes it and rambles off about having to stand out in the market and applying sex appeal as an audience hook before one of the other girls accuses her of just finding it hot. This results in them getting into a physical fight with one of the girls forcibly trying to drown the other in the shower drain. Welcome to Velma. This is your life for the next 10 episodes. Actually, the episode really starts with two cockroaches having sex, but never mind that. Anyway, a person wielding a hockey stick comes out of the steam and smashes it against one of the popular girls, dislodging her shower cap to reveal this to be our Daphne. The attacker then asks Daphne's opinion on race-blind casting, to which Daphne rattles off a bunch of opinions regarding white actors playing Jesus and how, as an Asian woman, she thinks it's fine when the opposite happens. We are two minutes into the first episode. You probably think I'm being hyperbolic with this recap and it cannot possibly be this densely loaded with Twitter hot takes and that I'm just trying to push some kind of personal bias by focusing in on it so hard. But you have my full promise that I am legitimately just relaying the dialogue as it has been happening. This is the dialogue for this show. Constantly, relentlessly and without any deviation or shakeup of this formula. Team shower discussion topic of the day. Have you ever noticed how pilot episodes of TV shows always have more gratuitous sex and nudity than the rest of the series? That's how we learned what Rachel Brosnahan's boobs look like. And Don Cheadle's butt. Well, I for one think it's lame. Um, the only hook a good show ever needs is good storytelling. Then why was your favorite part of the Riverdale pilot when Betty and Veronica kissed? Well, because I was instantly called out as tired in the scene. Uh, just admit, we are all secretly perverts. Never! And how do you feel about race-blind casting, Daphne? I mean, not to oversimplify a thorny issue, but everyone loves it when white people play Jesus or a professional boxer. Why can't it ever go the other way, right? If I were to sit here and comment on every single time one of the characters has a weird diatribe or sideways remark on some unrelated American social issue, or some snarky, <laughs> I spend a lot of time on TV tropes too, line, this video is going to be 10 hours long. So for the sake of all our sanities, I'm going to ignore the vast majority of these out of place non sequiturs and only mention them if I have anything to say about them or if they're exceptionally stupid in their placement in the script. I do want to talk a bit more about how these, um, let's call them hot takes for lack of a better word, I guess, completely fail at building the humor for this show, but I first want you to experience a little more than the first two minutes before I get into it. The attacker with the hockey stick who just smashed Daphne in the face is revealed to be Velma. She then calls Daphne a bitch, they face off, and the girl from earlier makes a trope-aware remark that if this was a TV show, then Daphne and Velma would kiss. Velma then walks over to a nearby locker so she can discover that one of the popular girls has been murdered. Ah! She has no brain! Oh. I am not dissing her, she has no brain! Ah! Why was Velma attacking Daphne? Literally no reason other than they don't like each other. Does Velma ever try and physically attack Daphne unprovoked later on in the show? Why did she ask about race-blind casting? Does it have anything to do with why she attacked her? Nope. Was there a reason for Velma to be in the showers other than to discover a murder had happened? Nope. Welcome to Velma. Yeah! After the title, we cut to Velma now at the police station. If you are preemptively guessing that this show is going to have opinions about cops and police brutality trussed up in a package of self-aware irony, you are correct. See, not to get into it yet, but you might have already noticed a problem with this kind of writing. The dialogue becomes so predictable and by the numbers once you have this show's angle picked, you might as well have a bingo card to play along to prevent your eyes from rolling back into your skull out of boredom. Velma has a very brief hallucinatory episode before the two cops walk in who are quickly established as being Daphne's moms. I will give credit that the backstory here is delivered in a good way. 
Daphne's moms tell Velma how they've missed her bitchy attitude and ask how long it's been since Daphne had Velma come over. And Velma answers, not since my mom went missing, remember, two years ago? Before getting angry that the cops have forgotten about this. In literally seconds, we know that Daphne and Velma used to be good friends, they had a falling out for some reason and now hate each other, Velma's mom has gone missing and the police aren't doing anything about it. All delivered in dialogue which, hot takes about atheism aside, makes the delivery of this information sound as close to natural as exposition dumping can be, and gives off some intrigue to the audience as to why Velma and Daphne have gone from BFFs to Velma attacking her unprovoked in the showers with a hockey stick. Oh, she's not in the police station for assault, by the way. She's there because Brenda's body was discovered in her locker. When I said the attack is never addressed again, I mean it. This show has the narrative structure of a submarine made of saltines. And also, Velma just lays out her motivation that she and Daphne hate each other because Daphne got hot and started hanging out with the other hot girls and started bullying her. Delivered as if Velma was reading off her D&D character sheet for the DM to approve. Yeah, until Daphne got hot and ditched me to hang out with Brenda and the other popular girls at Spooner's Mouth <laughs> Shop. I could kill them all! Okay, I see how this looks bad. Get used to this level of acting as well. Are you having fun yet? We're less than five minutes into a 25 minute episode and there are 10 of these! Anyway, the cops tell Velma she has 24 hours to solve the case as to why Brenda was in her locker before they arrest her for murder. Velma declares that she doesn't do mysteries anymore. And they let her go, where she leaves the station to run into... Say hello to this show's Fred. A brainless rich hot boy who's constantly on Instagram. <sighs> yeah, okay, sure. We learn that Velma has an obvious crush on him. He doesn't know who she is despite always cheating off her in Spanish class and he's dating Daphne who informs him Brenda is dead and it was probably Velma's fault. Velma asserts she didn't kill Brenda which causes her to have another hallucinatory episode before we cut to Velma's house with an overlaid scream of Velma's voice actor underselling the performance. Here we learn Velma's dad is a lawyer who is worried about the fact that Velma is a murder suspect, mostly because she's such a social outcast and her sociopathic behavior doesn't make her look good from a legal standpoint. He name drops the local malt shop which gives Velma an opportunity to exposition dump that her dad got the owner of the malt shop pregnant while Velma's mom is still missing and it's revealed the owner is now living with them. The owner is also one of those wannabe influencer moms who is obsessed with taking photo shoots and demanding Velma's dad pay for all kinds of tech like a high-end camera. She's also a basic bitch who doesn't even know how to use hashtags. No, I'm also hashtag the owner of Spooners. No, no, she's using hashtags correctly. For Tumblr that is. I would assume Tumblr would be Velma's social media platform of choice based on her, well, everything. But the creators of the show obviously don't know about any social media platforms outside of Instagram, which wouldn't be something worth commenting on if it wasn't for the fact that this show is desperate for you to know its creators are super clued up on writing tropes, topical talking points, and youth culture. So for Velma to not know how Tumblr hashtags works just tells me that these show writers are, in effect, posers. Even 2013 Velma had a Tumblr blog, come on man. I know this is a meaningless detail in the larger picture of this show, but the smugness that radiates off it is just so superficially confident, it delights me in pointing out how fake it is. It's like a skinwalker wearing the flesh of what it thinks young people, especially young queer people, are like. As written by adult 20 and 30 somethings who live in LA and actually paid muskrat for blue check marks. Edgy occurs when middle-brow, middle-aged profiteers are looking to suck the energy, not to mention spending money, out of the quote-unquote youth culture. So they come up with this fake concept of seeming to be dangerous when every move they make is the result of market research and a corporate master plan. By the way, while I'm on a tangent here, you get two check marks for the same price on Tumblr. Anyway, Sophie, the malt shop owner, tells Velma she's going to be a waitress now, and Velma's voice actress once again is unable to sell a scream convincingly. We cut to the malt shop in question, where the school is having Brenda's funeral. Just, just go with it, there's no point asking why. 
Daphne out to Velma as the prime murder suspect after insulting her as a former best friend. And within minutes of establishing Velma as going to be a waitress at the malt shop, Velma quits and walks out. Outside, she encounters a swarm of cockroaches, which is the second time we've seen a weird focus on roaches this episode. She hears a weird noise from behind a dumpster and runs into Fred. She asks him what he's doing out here and Fred says he's trying to psych himself up into being the man his father wants him to be, but he can't stop crying since Brenda died. Velma sees this as an opportunity to talk about herself and her issues with her own mom. We get a flashback where Velma recounts how she and her mom were really close, until one Christmas when Velma accidentally uncovered her presence early due to her love of mystery solving. Her mom left to buy her a new present that could be a surprise but never came home, with her car being found abandoned with nothing in it apart from her glasses and a present addressed to Velma. Velma feels so guilty about causing her mom's disappearance that now whenever she starts getting interested in mystery solving, she has a hallucinatory panic attack that's potentially fatal. We cut back from the flashback to Fred sitting like this as he listened, which is a nice bit of character acting. It's small, but it gives us a little insight into what kind of character Fred is in this version. That being, not too bright, but childishly endearing. You know, a moron. Anyway, he rattles off some trope away dialogue about now being hooked to the narrative due to Velma's backstory. Velma remarks that he actually remembered her name and Fred ponders that that's never happened before. I am mentioning all of this because this was building a picture of Fred's character in my head and the direction I thought they were going to take him in this, but we'll get to that. A car pulls up, scaring off Fred and introducing us to this show's version of Shaggy. Oh, I'm sorry. He's never actually called or even referred to as Shaggy, not even as a joke. He's just called Norville here. Like nobody calls me Norville. What's the matter, Norville? <laughs> That's not on tape, is it? Something wrong, Norville. Norville, Norville, Norville. <laughs> Very funny. He says he came to find her because she wasn't answering his messages. She's angry at him, saying she doesn't want to do their math homework together, and he should just do her homework for her like he always does. You might have started to form a picture of what kind of character Velma herself is, but don't worry, I will get there, in due time. Norville tells Velma he has a hunch as to who killed Brenda, which gets her to actually spend time with him. On TV shows, the malt shop owner is always a friendly black man or a spicy and meatball Italian. So you're like, oh, the kids come here for the folksy wisdom. But Sophie has no wisdom. Exactly. I think it has something to do with drugs, which I hate. <laughs> Comedy. Anyway, Norville works for the school paper and sent Brenda to find out why the malt shop is the most popular spot for teens in town. Brenda apparently said she took a photo of something weird in the bathroom before she was murdered, but never told him what, and now the camera is missing. Velma remembers that Sophie just got a new camera they can't afford, and assumes she must have killed Brenda to cover up something at the malt shop. Which is absolutely what happened and isn't Velma lashing out for personal reasons in an attempt to morally justify ruining the lives of people she dislikes. Because Velma is our plucky, socially awkward main character, so any horrendous awful behavior she exhibits is supposed to be seen as a character flaw that the audience can totally relate to. I remember the time I tried to frame someone from murder just because they had the audacity to... um... exist. Norville suggests they try and find the camera together since it's his, but Velma doesn't want to spend time with him until he points out that he could help her with her hallucinations. Now that Norville has made his friendship transactional, Velma agrees. Also, it's made clear that Norville has a crush on Velma for reasons he should probably see a therapist for to unpack why he equates abuse with attraction. Anyway, Velma finds the camera, but it turns out Sophie just has a side gig photographing babies, and Velma has another episode. I will say, the animation of Velma's deteriorating mental state is really good. Not just the animation itself, but the color and art direction as well. I really like the strong contrasting light and the pure black shadows. Sophie saves Velma's life and Velma's dad tells her she needs to accept that her mom didn't disappear, she left them. 
Velma instantly rejects this in a way that suggests this topic of conversation has come up before, and for a moment I thought we might actually get a glimpse at some character vulnerability after so much awful. But instead, we get the same flashback as earlier, except this time Velma seems to remember the events more clearly in a way that is horribly unfunny and realizes her childhood with her mother was far from the idyllic fairy tale she always thought it was. Velma instantly accepts her mom probably did leave them and throws away the present she's been holding on to. I want to take a small break here just to give some appreciation to the music. It's not very noticeable, but if you watch the show with some good headphones, the music, especially in the first episode, is really good. It's understated and manages to have a certain sense of style to it that wouldn't be completely out of place in a CW show but manages to avoid coming across as derivative or as a royalty-free music track titled as Suspense Music on YouTube. I just wanted to point it out because I don't think many other reviewers would mention it, and I genuinely think De Leon did a great job. I can see myself listening to these on their own if I ever found them. Anyway, good feelings over now, back to the school. Velma decided she's hot now. Are you an exchange student from a more sexually liberated country? No, it's Velma. I'm just unburdened by the belief I caused my mother to go missing. We did it, you know what jokes so. are! Olivia, um, this girl, points out Velma is just doing this to distract people from the fact that she's a murder suspect, causing the other kids to throw things at her. One of them flinging a guillotine. However, before it can hit Velma, Fred grabs it. <gasps> <gasps> I would like to give a shout out to the only moment in this episode that managed to make me laugh. Fred stands up for Velma and gets the other kids to back off. At this point in the show, I had the fool's dream that they were building up to a fun dynamic between Velma and Fred moving forward. The social pariah, who is actually extremely smart, but due to her misanthropy, gets in her own way a lot, but who could be an excellent detective, teaming up with the guy who was at first just a walking stereotype of a TikTok fuckboy who suddenly realizes he might actually find some substance in life and starts becoming interested in this whole mystery solving thing despite clearly not being very bright. Kind of setting them up like Velma is the shadow leader of the group and Fred is her well-meaning but dumb sidekick whose charisma and popularity ends up being a great help to investigations despite the fact that it's everything Velma hates. And this could lead to forming Mysteries Inc. as it opens the door for Daphne to become involved as the bitchy popular girl who is afraid to reveal she's actually highly intelligent because it could damage her image. And Norville who has a crush on Velma, while Velma has a crush on Fred who is dating Daphne who used to be friends with Velma. This is what I thought they were setting up because I made the stupid mistake of thinking this show has any regard for writing characters as actual people with complex personalities. Instead of walking Twitter hot takes and receptacles for pop culture references and verbally pointing out writing tropes so they can subvert audience expectation. <laughs> Velma goes to the bathroom to wash off her makeup where the popular girls corner her and there's a drawn out family guy style joke about one of the girls peeing and washing her hands while this is happening. And I wondered if the writers of the show might be fans of the most popular girls in school. Have fun smelling my poops, bitches! Anyway, Daphne tells Velma to stay away from Fred, and Velma learns Fred refuses to have sex with Daphne. Don't ask how the conversation got onto that topic. Velma asks if he's gay, but Daphne says she doesn't think so, since he also kicks everyone out of the malt shop bathroom when he's in there. With this plot point delivered, the popular girls leave as their function in the scene has been fulfilled. Velma goes to get Norville, who is busy making an anti-weed page for the school paper in a meta joke I am sure has all of you slapping your knees in mirth. And Velma forces Norville to drive her to Fred's house, which is exceptionally large as Fred's family owns an overpriced Ascot chain store. Sure, whatever, we had to get the Ascot joke in there somewhere. You know, throughout the years, a lot of people have asked me, Fred, why the scarf? And I always tell them the same thing. Why don't you mind your own f***ing business, pal? Norville asks why Velma thinks Fred would kill Brenda. Why wouldn't he? If I were a rich white dude, I'd kill everybody just to get away with it. You know, I could be watching Scooby-Doo meets Kiss instead. Right, 
Norville worries Velma might have another episode, but Velma claims she's cured after learning her mom just left them and it wasn't Velma's fault. A quick mention that this shot is cool. Velma then has another episode and asks Norville for help. He tries to calm her down and ends up mentioning he has a crush on her. Velma thinks he's joking because the concept that Norville could be a romantic partner is hilarious to her. After putting herself together, Velma conveniently finds Norville's camera in the room she's wandered into. She finds out that there isn't any weird evidence on the camera other than a few photos of Fred in the malt shop bathroom. Right on cue, Fred makes a dramatic entrance looking like he's coming down from a lost weekend. See, I can make dumb references too, it's not hard. He reveals that Brenda uncovered the fact that Fred hasn't finished going through puberty yet, which Fred is mortified by both in terms of his social standing at school, but also because of his strange relationship with his father who wants him to be a real man and who is pressuring him to be more assertive as he is to inherit the family business one day. Wow, that's, that's actually rather compelling character motivation. Fred says he's going to do to Velma what he did to Brenda, but before anything can happen, Daphne's mom bursts in and shoots him in the legs. They arrest Fred and Velma is off the hook for the murder. Fred insists he's innocent, saying he was just going to do to Velma what he did to Brenda by paying her to shut up. He also points out he's too big of a puss to kill anyone, his words not mine, which gives Velma an opportunity to insult Norville for daring to be attracted to her. I'd laugh, Fred. If I wasn't standing next to this secret comedian over here, man, if I found humor attractive, I would be all over you right now. Oh well. Seriously, Norville, therapy. We cut back to Velma's house where Norville is dropping her off. Velma retrieves her mom's presents from the trash, saying she still feels guilty about her mom going missing and she feels her mother did love her and wouldn't have just run away. And it's because of these reasons that she's still having panic attacks. She notices a bunch of cockroaches on their recycling and gives an ironic mention that roaches are gross and that's a mystery she doesn't want to solve. And you are probably thinking the same thing I was in that the main bad guy in this Scooby-Doo offshoot would be some kind of cockroach controlling villain like, I don't know, something from Dishonored. Especially since this is the third time the show has blatantly made a point of focusing on cockroaches. This is the only episode this happens in. These roaches it kept focusing on communicating that they were thematically important? Yeah, they mean nothing. They're not even a red herring. There's literally no reason as to why the show kept focusing on them other than coincidence. Unless there's going to be some or other cockroach based villain in the second season. But the show doesn't seem to give a shit about the inherent language of film, so why should I listen to anything it tries to say? Oh, and there's another popular girl corpse in Velma's recycling. And that's the end. I used to be curious as to why so many people said they dipped out after the first episode. I know now. But also, knowing this is where a lot of people gave up, some weird, twisted part of me felt obligated to keep going. Mostly because I was watching the first episode to see if there was enough material here to turn into a video and, to my own detriment, I have found that there is. Fred is escorted out of his house as he's arrested, and in case you were worried the show might not take the time to joke about the size of his dick, don't worry, the first minute of episode 2 has you covered. Velma is watching the arrest on TV and is furious when they get her name wrong, but her bruised ego is quickly overshadowed when she learns the only lawyer willing to defend Fred is her own dad. Sophie points out that this case could make them rich because she wants a baby monitor that shoots on film, which would be a funny joke if the show didn't feel the need to then undercut it by explaining why it's funny. Here, let me show you. I already bought a baby monitor that shoots on film. It just looks more real, you know? This is a small example, but this is one of the bigger problems this show has with its humor. It never delivers a punchline properly. That is the few times there even is a punchline. When the show actually delivers a joke which could be marginally successful, rather than saying the line and allowing it to hit like saying, we can get a baby monitor that shoots on film, the show is so terrified you might have missed the joke that it always takes extra time to double down and explain to you why what it just said was funny. It just looks more real, you know? 
Yes, I am aware of why shooting on film is the preferred method when it comes to actual movies and why applying this logic, which is often seen as pretentious to something as ludicrous as a baby monitor, is obnoxious and satirizing the epidemic on social media of the constructed life with the mommy influence going to ridiculous extremes to sell the image of motherhood and living a humble life. That fucking stove is $20,000. You will never have this life because she's rich. Because she is making this out to look like it's attainable for you and you think that this is a goal. I am so glad you decided to tell the joke and then elbow me in the ribs to go, <laughs> you get it? It makes your humor extra funny. No really, I'm so glad your disdain for your audience's intelligence has you so vigilant to make sure nothing slips by us. Re really appreciate that. Well, Seapuff, aren't you being overly nasty in this review compared to High Guardian Spice? No, because I was actively holding back from being unnecessarily harsh with High Guardian Spice, because I didn't want to viciously tear down what was obviously a lot of people's very first job in this industry. Velma, on the other hand, is very clearly a product made by creators who are already well established and should honestly know better. But they don't. And so I see no reason to treat them with kid gloves. Besides, the overall tone of Velma, which was not present in High Guardian Spice, is an open hatred for the audience for having the audacity to watch it. High Guardian Spice was incompetent and failed to deliver what it wanted to. But Velma is functioning exactly as intended. Anyway, getting back to the show. Fred's a rich white guy with a tiny dong. He did it. Velma goes back to school where she says every single other person at the school are either sheep or high, which gives Norville a reason to give another meta joke about how Velma should kill him if he ever gets into anything involving 420. He asks Velma if she knows what 420 means and she says yes, it's code for adults who still watch cartoons. So <laughs> Velma, who do you think this show is for? Because it sounds like you just hate everything involving your existence. You seem to have nothing but disdain for teens, you've made it very clear you hate the kind of audience your type of show is made for, and you also seem to have a deep-seated hatred for the very characters you're trying to adapt. Ignoring that for now, Velma wants to find Daphne so she can get her mom's cold case file. Norville asks if he should come along in case she has another mystery-induced hallucination, but Velma has once again decided she no longer has panic attacks for no solid reason. She just says she doesn't get them anymore. Velma tries to schmooze up to Daphne before giving up and just admitting she needs something from her. When Daphne refuses, Velma uses the for all time's sake manipulation tactic by bringing out a BFF necklace we saw her retrieve from the back of a forgotten drawer in the intro. Clearly this is a deeply valued friendship. Daphne says she'll get the cold case file for Velma if she pays her $500. So, so much for all of that, I guess. Seriously, what was the, what's the point of all of this? Fred and his parents are discussing Fred's murder charge. He is the future CEO of Jones Gentleman's Accessories. Oh, Frank Welker, no. Velma's dad says they're going to play up the angle that Fred is a literal child to sell the idea that he's incapable of killing anyone. And it was at this point I sadly realized they were not going to have Fred's character portrayed as the hot and popular, really stupid but endearingly enthusiastic sidekick to solving this mystery. And we're instead just going to double down on completely infantilizing him for the sake of having a rich white dude as a punching bag. A direction which is just... It's so boring. It's so boring and superficial and gives the narrative nothing to work with. So Fred only exists here for the show to kick around and humiliate. Okay, and then what? You've humiliated him now, so where are you gonna take this next? How is this gonna aid the narrative you're building? How does this make the story better? All that it's going to lead to is you humiliating him and then humiliating him again. I mean, if you wanted a punching bag that has no deeper function in the story, that's a choice. But why do it with one of the pivotal main characters? Actually, let's talk a bit about Fred. The first thing we'd better do is split up and search the school for clues. Fred in the original cartoon didn't really have a personality. He was the de facto leader of the group by nature of being the good looking one of the two dudes. 
and he's voiced by Frank Welker, the human sound effect. Like, who's Frank Welker? Frank Welker is the voice actor behind all of my favorite cartoon characters. Megatron from Transformers, Slimer from the real Ghostbusters, Fred over there, and even Scooby-Doo! Me? Don't worry, there's no way our voices come from some guy named Frank. And that's it. That's basically all there was to Fred at first. Look, the Scooby-Doo cartoon was one of the first forays into tapping into the then popular youth culture. You didn't need to do much to relate to your middle school target audience other than show them cool teenagers doing cool things. Especially when you had literally no competition other than yourself. Fred was so pointless, they got rid of him for most of the 70s and 80s. Then when he started showing up again throughout the 90s and early 2000s, they needed Fred to have something more going on than nothing. Even it was just a basic character trope. So he became the vaguely jockish dude who was now making out with Daphne when the others weren't watching. You and Fred check upstairs. Velma and I'll look in the basement. Daphne? I mean, Scooby, you and Velma check upstairs. This extended into the live action movies, which I don't think people realize what a massive impact the live action movie had for everyone in the main cast moving forward. But we don't have time to get into that. The live action movie introduced a new characteristic, which I don't think was completely intended. See, the live action film was based on James Gunn's opinions on how he remembered each character. So Shaggy was a stoner, Scrappy Doo was the worst creature alive, and Fred was a jock. And because Fred was the good looking jock, and this was the early 2000s, it means Fred was also kind of dumb. Hey. You're doing that thing again where you take everything I say out of context. You're trying to make it look like I think Coolsville sucks. All Fred Jones had to say was, I think Coolsville sucks. In light of the city's recent chaos. But one of the other major changes in the franchise happened a few years earlier with Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, where Fred was also kind of jockish, but managed to better grasp his good clean American boy image. And after the live action movie, these two character points blended together in following media. Eventually, Fred evolved into a golden retriever of a man to steal a phrase. A guy who was extremely sincere and wholesome, but not exactly the sharpest tool in the shed. Sometimes he played this up a little too much, turning him into someone who probably needs a handler, which they often made Daphne because dumb guy with smart girlfriend is a popular trope. Then, in 2010, Scooby-Doo Mysteries Incorporated came along, the quote-unquote edgy version of Scooby-Doo. And naturally, they panicked with Fred because there's so little there to work with, and they needed a strong personality type because Mysteries Incorporated was all about taking good-natured but still satirical jabs at the characters, except for Velma who they turned into a bitch. But with Fred, they didn't have a strong character to work with other than he's dumb, He's built like a Ken doll, and he's really, really nice. So they made him obsessed with booby traps. Like, weirdly obsessed with this one hyper-specific thing that nobody else was into. And this tiny, seemingly innocuous detail had a snowball effect. Because Fred had very little character other than he's sincere, and he's kind of dumb, and he's built like a brick shithouse, this detail of him having a very hyper-specific hobby that nobody else was into kept getting reused in future content. In Scooby-Doo Meets Kiss, the best Scooby-Doo movie ever made, don't even argue with me on this, you will lose, the rest of the gang is super into the band Kiss, except for Fred, who, despite coming along to the concert, is really grumpy. He doesn't like Kiss, he doesn't like rock and roll, and he thinks his favorite band is a thousand times better than Kiss, while also being apparently oblivious to the fact that his favorite band's lyrics are kind of... um... Oh no, no. don't tug my ascot, don't pull my ascot, not as gone. no baby. You and this carried on. Fred never had the one thing he was into, but he was always into something. And it was often lame, or weird, or something you would never think anyone would have a hyperfixation on. But Fred does, and he is really, really enthusiastic about it. But in a way where you don't have the heart to tell him nobody else cares about what he's info dumping about. 
You're going to have to contribute something to the conversation, Fred. Did you know that nets have been used in hunting for over 30,000 years? I love the circus. You know, I took that circus arts class last summer. We know. No one wants to hear your net facts, Fred. I know, but but it's just... It's just I love nets so much. You don't have any idea that, of what they're made of and what they can mean to somebody. They're there. I think I really could have mastered the trapeze if I hadn't broken all those bones. The trick is to not fall. That's great, Fred. And thus, Fred has emerged as a new character. One that is still the good-looking all clean American boy who leads the gang, but he is also now the lame one. The one with weird hobbies he seems completely obsessed with until he's randomly obsessed with something new the next time you see him, and will ramble on about for a solid two hours if you let him. He's kind of dumb, but he's not stupid. He's a bit of a weirdo who the rest of the gang obviously has a soft spot for, even though they have no idea what he's talking about half the time. In short, we stand Fred Jones, Autistic Coded King. The Velma cartoon was so close to giving us a fun version of Fred that honestly would have fit in perfectly with the vibe they were aiming for. But they didn't do that. Instead, they wanted Fred to be the hot dumb guy so they can humiliate him for most of the show. But sadly, it doesn't even really work because at no point does Fred actually do anything worse than the other characters to make you feel he deserves the constant humiliation he faces in this show. The times he does do something bad, it's always painted as him doing it because he's an idiot. Not because he's mean-spirited or inherently racist or sexist. The worst thing about him is they gave him an anger management problem, but even this is only ever used as a joke and usually only further illustrates what a pathetic creature of a man Fred is. An anger issue isn't inherently fun or funny, but if you're so intent on emasculating a character that you can't even let his anger issues serve any purpose, other than to make his own life harder for himself, you failed at making the audience dislike the character you want to use as a punching bag. Hey, why do you hate Fred so much? Fred is not a likable character in the Velma cartoon at all, but he is one of the least monstrous characters specifically because he's too dumb to actually cause any real damage to anyone but himself. But you also don't like him because of the level of pathetic the show makes him stoop to. The second episode's main plot point for why Fred couldn't be the murderer is because he's unable to cut his own food to eat. I find it quite telling that Fred is listed on the do-gooder wiki, while Velma and Daphne are both listed on the villains wiki. Okay, enough distractions, back to the show. Velma's dad decides the best course of action is to convince the jury that Fred is too much of a sweet innocent little boy to commit murder. This upsets both Fred and Fred's dad, but Fred's mother is insistent that Fred can't go to jail, mostly because Fred wouldn't survive probably a valid concern. Velma has gone to Norville's house for some reason, but in the meantime runs into Daphne's moms who are also there because Norville's mom is the school principal. Is anyone else started to feel like the way all the characters are written to be so tangled up in each other's lives is eerily similar to a soap opera? Like weirdly so. Anyway, the cops are there because apparently the school has a drug problem. Velma isn't really interested and bursts into Norville's room, where he's busy hosting a live stream where he reviews weird snack foods. And apparently he's kind of a popular streamer too. I will admit, this is a genius use of Shaggy as a character. Shaggy running a live stream reviewing weird snacks is not only in character for him, but the fact we learn later in the episode that his live streams are so popular because stoners watch him is... This is way too good an idea for this show, and it just makes me angry because it proves that these writers do have the ability to have good ideas. They just decide to completely self-sabotage them at every opportunity. Anyway, Velma wants Norville to give her $500. He says he would absolutely give her $500, but he doesn't have that kind of money right now. So she leaves as Norville can no longer be beneficial to her, because every relationship Velma has in this show is transactional. 
But in case you were thinking this shows constant treatment of Norval as the poor lovesick fool who allows himself to get abused would paint him as sympathetic, Norval then reveals himself to be a textbook case of the nice guy. You know the ones. The kind of guy who thinks girls are vending machines that if you put enough friendship tokens in, sex will eventually fall out. Norval decides if he can get that $500 for Velma, he can then pressure her into dating him out of guilt. Problematic, but effective. Since Velma is unable to get the money, Daphne says Velma can help her with her work, selling drugs. According to TV, it's morally okay to deal drugs if your life is just kind of crappy. Like, your kid's sick, you're a widow with a mortgage, you have to live on a lake in Missouri. Those are all white people, Daphne. Minorities on TV can only deal drugs to escape poverty. Damn it, uh, sorry, sorry. I keep thinking of better Scooby-Doo things to watch. Anyway, Velma agrees to help Daphne sell drugs. However, she's so terrible at it that all the stoners immediately call her out as a narc. Meanwhile, Norval has decided to sell his kidney and Fred gets further humiliated before being called Hitler and the show makes a joke about how people compare everyone to Hitler these days. Neat. Cutting back to Velma and Daphne, we learn that Daphne is trying to save up money to hire a private investigator to find her real parents. But before we can get more info, Daphne's moms confront them as the drug dealers, leading Velma and Daphne to do a quote-unquote wacky chase through the school complete with shoujo bubble sexual tension when Velma and Daphne grab each other's hands. After Daphne's mom gets distracted because they're terrible cops, Velma and Daphne realize they kind of enjoy hanging out with each other like they used to. But before anything can happen, one of Daphne's regulars messages her. They go to meet up with him, revealing it to be Velma's dad. Velma is upset to find her dad wearing a beanie, but says she's not shocked at all to find him buying drugs. By the way, we never see him use or buy drugs again after this episode. He, on the other hand, is upset to find his daughter selling drugs and she confesses she needs the money to get her mom's cold case file. Velma's dad says he will give her the money if she can help him prove Fred's innocence. I don't know why they keep coming to Velma to solve these things. Velma is reluctant because proving Fred is innocent would mean she'd have to admit she misjudged someone. No, really. Velma wants to double down on Fred being guilty until she realizes how pathetic he is and, like I spoiled earlier, realizes he can't even cut his own food, let alone stab anyone. Meanwhile, Norville's kidney thing is interrupted by, I don't know, this guy who was on a wanted poster earlier, but before Norville can get shot, the stoners outside the motel recognize him from his streams and rescue him from getting killed. Again, Norval running a weird snack stream whose audience is mostly stoners is a really funny and good idea. Which is why after this episode, we never see or hear about him having a live stream ever again. Daphne's moms arrest the entire operation and give Norval the $500 reward money. But since this plot point is no longer relevant, Norval tells them to keep the money because he will pop culture reference instead. Finally, at the trial, Velma is called to the witness stand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help me, Shonda Rhimes, I do. Ooh, who's an edgy show? Who's an edgy show? You are. Yes, you are. What an edgy show. Velma says the thing, and the jury claps. But Fred is so insulted by everyone laughing at him, he flies into a rage and gets arrested for the murder anyway. So this entire episode was completely pointless, but then again, I'm not super upset because this entire show is a waste of time and I'm only doing it to myself. Fred gets thrown into the same cell as the guy who attacked Norval. At the end of the episode, Daphne shows up and gives Velma the cold case file for… reasons. Velma finds in the file that the last place her mom's cell phone was pinged was in Fred's house, fully convincing her once again that Fred is guilty and triggering another panic attack after she's already twice now claimed she no longer gets those. Daphne freaks out and tries to snap Velma out of her attack and then kisses her. This does the job, but even after the attack stops, they continue kissing. So here's a second problem with this show's humor. It never commits to the bit. This kiss seems like it doesn't know if it's trying to be a genuine moment of payoff or if it's meant to play up the gross kissing thing and really lean into it. So it goes halfway between the two. 
It's animated rather flatly, but not particularly funny, but they overlaid exaggerated kissing noises over it and hoped that that would be enough to make it funny. It is not. The reason the guillotine is the only time I've laughed so far is because it's a situation escalated to a ridiculous extreme, but the show does this so rarely. See, I think at this point I kinda realized what they were trying to do, and it reminded me of another show, one from a long time ago. Way, way back. Clone High was an animated show that aired on MTV in 2002. The premise of the show was that several figures from history had been cloned by the government and are now all in high school together. But the actual premise was that it was a satire of teen drama shows of the time, especially The O.C. Wait, what do you mean The O.C. came out after Clone High? From California. I have a vague suspicion that Velma very much wants to do the same thing. It wants to sell itself as a self-aware parody of teen drama shows, the likes of Riverdale, which it name drops in the very first episode, as well as things like Pretty Little Liars, 13 Reasons Why, or Euphoria. But it severely missteps when you compare it to something like Clone High, which has the exact same goal. One difference is Clone High appears to have been written from the perspective of Wow, I was stupid as a teenager. Whereas Velma is written from the perspective of, Wow, teenagers are stupid. Clone High is very much making fun of the absolute melodrama inherent to its teenage cast and high school location, as well as its own genre of being a so-called teen drama. Don't get on that plane. Leo! <gasps> Don't get on that plane. Velma, on the other hand, seems more focused on writing its main characters as horrible people, repeatedly making meta comments about their own roles in the narrative and how a lot of their awful character traits directly come from the fact that they're teenagers, while at the same time, writing everyone else also as terrible as one would write adult characters in a teen drama who are automatically put in an antagonistic light because they are the symbol of authority. This stuff has been done since the freaking Breakfast Club, which keeps popping up in these videos for some reason. I guess it's just one of the best examples of really well-written teens. What did they do to you? They ignore me. That and Avatar, but they didn't go to high school much in that show. Anyway, this means Velma has an underlying nasty streak to it, which reads as hatred for its demographic as well as its characters, whereas Clone High writes its parody with a level of experience. Like the writers are looking back and laughing at how silly they themselves used to be as kids. And because Clone High is mostly just poking fun at itself just as much as teen drama, it's not afraid to double up on every joke. Clone High's humor comes mostly from taking a teen drama cliche, dialing it up to 11, and then just when you think the punchline has landed, they push it just that extra bit into ridiculousness. Velma acts as if simply stating that it's self-aware of some tropes it's playing into is, in of itself, the joke. And then, like I said, it kneecaps itself by explaining this joke to you. But at no point does Velma allow itself to just go full-on stupid, just really push the ridiculous nature of the teen drama to its breaking point and then keep pushing to see just how far you can take it, and do it fast and do it snappy. And because these two shows have an almost identical goal of the teen drama parody, they often have the exact same joke in them. Which means, I get to compare identical scenes to each other and show you the funny version compared to the Velma version. Here's how Velma treats the joke about an obnoxious witch fuckboy trying to hit on 
the smart girl. But while I'm glad you've learned to appreciate inner beauty. Oh, yes. Yeah, speak your mind, baby. Right. Well, I also prefer inner beauty, but now I just find you gross. What? How? You, you know I'm rich, right? And here's Clone High. So, uh, are you uh, drunk enough yet to sleep with me? Answer the question! Here's Velma joking about the fact that the popular kid doesn't recognize the nerdy one who has the obvious hots for them. Fred? Do I know you? It's Velma from school. You cheat off me in Spanish because you think I'm Mexican. Maybe. I have a disease where I can't recognize people who aren't hot. My doctor says it's basically sickle cell for rich guys. And here's Clone High. Cleopatra, coming at ya! Ow! Do I know you? Gandhi. We had every class together last year. I gave you one of my kidneys. I miss him. So now we go back to this kiss. It's not pushing itself into being ridiculous and it's not leaning into being fan service. So it's just nothing. And then they add that Norval sees them kissing and the joke ends with Norval just making a self-aware comment about sitcoms lying to him. And the joke scene and episode just kind of ends on a wet fart. Incidentally, yes, they did this trope in Clone High as well. But your taste still lingers on my lips like it just lays down upon you as an I star. That no I good cheating tramp. See, it's one thing to look your audience dead in the eye and go, Haha, yes, we show writers are aware of this trope. Let us state it so that you can be surprised by our self-awareness. And then just letting it die on the vine. But it's another thing for the writer to be aware of a trope, so then they do the trope, but push the trope to such a ridiculous extreme that the inherent humor in it is exposed, which makes the audience realize just how stupid the very concept of the trope is just by doing it. There are so many times in Velma where a character stops the conversation to go, oh, this is the part where me, the character trope I am, am supposed to do this thing. And I would go, Yes! That would have been funny if you actually did it! Velma is so self-conscious and has so little confidence, it's terrified of looking stupid to its audience, which it sees as being just as nasty and full of bad faith criticism as it is. So it self-deprecates by pointing out the trope before the audience can, but doesn't actually do anything to replace the trope it's calling out. And in the very few instances it does lean into a trope, such as Velma's constantly resurfing panic attacks, it does so in a way where it's annoyed by its own predictability. Ah! Oh god, my heart! So this entire show's humor is 1. Point out meta-awareness, but not replacing it with anything else. 2. Disconnected pop culture and American social issue references. 3. Explaining the joke. And 4 not committing to the bit. And this style of non-humor remains constant throughout the entire show, which would be commendable if it was actually funny. But this show is too self-conscious to allow itself to be laughed at, which, considering it's trying to be a comedy, is a problem. So yeah, let's do this. I've avoided it long enough with winks and nods. Let's finally talk about the only thing you've ever really wanted to know about me. Is Velma Dinkley g -g 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 gay? Velma. Yes, Velma is gay. This isn't some world-breaking news. Velma's been gay for years now. In Mysteries Incorporated, which came out in 2013, Velma straight up had a female romantic interest which was planned to be set in stone canon in later seasons. Before Velma premiered, there was a brand new Scooby-Doo special whose major feature was the fact that Velma was very, very, very blatantly spelled out to be attracted to girls, with Daphne being her wingman bestie, by the way. Okay, who am I kidding? I'm crushing big time Daphne! Velma's gay, we know, it's not that shocking. Have you seen the way she dresses? Velma meets up with Norval at school to show him the cold case file, but he's busy being pissy about the fact that he saw Velma and Daphne kissing, and I'm more entertained by what's going on in the background in these shots because they're unironically the funniest part of the scene. What's all that about? Wait, what? 
Anyway, Norval and Velma are arguing about Velma possibly being gay and her insisting it's not a big deal and then getting annoyed that Norval told his dad who's the school guidance counselor. This is all brought up so Norval can tell us his dad is giving the school a mental health assembly. And again, I will admit, Nutso the mental health squirrel is a pretty good joke. That's so awful. <laughs> I love it. Anyway, blah blah blah, American social issue reference and jokes, the girls are getting self-defense classes. What this has to do with mental health is beyond me. You could honestly have cut the entire mental health assembly thing and just immediately gone to the girls getting self-defense classes due to the murders. You can even still have Velma bitch about why the boys don't get don't murder girls classes and the principal give lip service to American school funding and you wouldn't lose anything. Seriously, why was this mental health assembly even here other than to take up time? Velma and Norville ditch the assembly to see Fred and ask him about Velma's mom. Velma has padded her bra and she and Norville talk in circles about her attraction to Daphne and how she's confused how she can be attracted to Daphne when she's also fantasized about Fred. You, you know bisexuals are a thing, right? Anyway, Velma has another panic attack and this time it involves Daphne and Fred. Norval snaps her out of it by suggesting they kiss too, since it worked with Daphne in a way that really sits badly with me. It is during this panic attack that I realize that Norval's voice actor is actually really funny. He's just working with terrible material. No, don't kiss me. I'm already too confused. Kissing me would confuse you? Wait, why? Velma's panic attack gets them thrown out of the prison before they can see Fred. Norval says he'll ask Fred in her place because he's got a plan to get Fred to open up. He also says it'll give Velma some time to figure out her feelings for Daphne in a way that screams get over her so I can date you instead, which is great. I love these new interpretation of these characters. Also, I blame you for this mystery incorporated. Not only did you start this very weird take that if Velma is a lesbian, it should mean she's a bitch, but you also put forward this extremely weird idea that Velma and Shaggy should date because they're both single and stand next to each other a lot? Back at school, Daphne's moms are giving the female self-defense class. The moms team up Daphne and Velma to demonstrate the moves, but they both freak out and run to the bathroom. Well, I mean, you kissed me to stop your hallucination, but then you kissed me like, whoa. Well, then let's just say we kissed each other, even though we both know it was you who kissed me, which is impossible because I don't like you like that. I was made for loving you, baby. I don't think I'll get another chance, but I just want to point out Daphne looks really cute in this outfit with the ponytail and everything. Actually, Daphne's overall design in this show is really good. I like most of the character designs. Velma being a pocket tank is really nice to see, since in recent years, every time they do an update of Velma, they cinch in her waist and give her an hourglass figure. I like that this show keeps her as this little bullet. I think Norval might have looked better with dreads but otherwise he's fine and Fred is also really good. This show actually does a great job of taking the original 1960s mod fashion and updating it to modern style. I think Daphne's design in this show is actually better than her design for the Scoob movie. Rather than go for the daddy's little princess schoolgirl style, they've given her this academic but make it slutty look which I genuinely think is great. I also noticed that the character designer knew exactly what they were doing here. I don't know why they didn't just commit to the side shave, but the comb over here looks really good. And I like her geometric earrings. Making her Asian also works because this eye shape suits the overall look and I like the bone structure they gave her face. My only criticism is that I don't know what they were doing with these knees. Daphne looks great every time she's in a medium shot, but as soon as she's shown full body, it looks weird. I don't know why they pronounced her kneecaps like this since it makes her look off balance. I would have gone for something more Bruce Tim style. Look at them legs. Look at them legs. They're amazing. Look at them legs. Look at them legs. They're amazing. And although I like the saddle shoes, I feel either her feet are too small or the shoe design is a wrong choice since it also makes her feel unbalanced and not grounded properly. The scoop outfit has her in ankle boots and I think something more solid would have worked better here too. 
like give her some Doc Martens or something. Overall, I like Daphne's design and I think she looks really good in this gym outfit too. Daphne and Velma get into a real fight and Daphne's moms break them up, saying they're not allowed to have a personal beef in this fight until tomorrow, when they're having a women's self-defense tournament, which is a really funny idea for a joke, but somehow it doesn't land here. Probably something to do with delivery, I don't know. We do get a joke that does land, however. What? How will fighting girls help us defend ourselves against attacks from guys? Is first prize a gun? It is now! Great idea! Norville has gone to see Fred and decided a good way to get Fred to tell him anything more about Velma's mom is for Norville to act as a therapist. Ah, uh, so the mental health thing at the start was to set up that Norville's dad is a school counselor so we could get to this scene where Norville tries to be one too. Okay, got it, whatever, moving on. Fred doesn't want to talk about Velma's mom and calls over his cellmate, who is the guy Norval got arrested. Norval tries to calm the situation by explaining he wants information so he can get his friend to become more than a friend if he plays his cards right. Ugh. The guy tells him that romantic relationships between old friends rarely work out and Norval has a little incel meltdown and shoves this convicted criminal. Back at his house, it seems Norville got himself clocked in the face for this and he's talking to his dad about this therapy thing. Norville's dad tells him the true secret to a good therapist is wearing a disarming cardigan and, upon lending his to Norville, it seems now Norville gives off an air that makes you want to unload your problems onto him. We cut back to the self-defense tournament and watch the girls beat the crap out of each other for a while. Velma keeps winning by going limp and Daphne keeps winning by demolishing the other girls. Before Velma and Daphne face up against each other, they have a confrontation in the bathroom again and Velma admits that she does like Daphne more than just a friend. Daphne says the problem is she has a lot more at stake if she were to admit she likes Velma and Velma takes this to mean Daphne doesn't want to ruin her popular girl reputation. Norville meets up with Fred again, but this time with the secret weapon of the cardigan. This causes Fred to admit that when they bought his house, they were going to burn it for the insurance, but his dad stood him up before offhandedly mentioning some Indian lady showing up, but he didn't pay much attention to her. This is the first time this show has made clear what Velma's ethnicity is, which I genuinely don't care, except I was supposed to find it racist that Fred thought Velma was Mexican, which only had me going, oh, that's supposed to be racist, so I guess she's not Mexican. Norval accepts, Fred really doesn't know anything and moves to leave but bumps into the guy he got arrested again, who won't let him go until he extends this therapy session to the rest of the prisoners who have been taken in by the cardigan. Back at school, it's time for Velma and Daphne to face off against each other. Daphne is ready to throw down, but Velma has stolen her diary and her killer move to win the self-defense tournament is to read it out to the audience. This doesn't go over well with the school, however. Now laugh as we watch her precious popularity fade away. Why would we do that? Mental health is no joke, no matter how lame Lamont is. Okay, kinda based, to be honest. It's like the one joke about current social issues I like because it's actually positive and doesn't shit all over something and is an actual subversion of expectations. It just turns Velma's shitty actions against her. I mean, it's not funny, but it's a twist I kind of respect. This little stunt puts Velma in the guidance counselor's office where she's told she needs to apologize to Daphne, which she doesn't want to do. But after being exposed to a calming waterfall feature, she admits that she's confused about her feelings for Daphne because she would always talk to her mom about her feelings. And if she talks to someone else, it's like she's admitting her mom really is gone. Again, this would be a really good character moment if it wasn't mentioned here, undercut with self-deprecating humor and then never brought up again. Meeting up with Norval, he tells her Fred isn't involved with her mom's disappearance. This upsets Velma because it means her one big clue is a dead end. She decides she needs to apologize to Daphne and tells Norville to wait in the car for her. Norville realizes he's forgotten he's scheduled for a group therapy session at the prison and him not showing up causes the prisoners to riot and escape. This is actually a plot point and not just a stupid joke, so remember it. 
Velma apologizes to Daphne for reading her journal and then ham-fistedly says Daphne should now apologize to her for saying she isn't popular enough to be friends with. Daphne rightfully points out she never said that and Velma just assumed it on her own. Daphne is angry that Velma never even wondered why Daphne was seeing the school guidance counselor. And Velma admits she didn't read those parts of Daphne's journal and was just looking for quote, sexy stuff. Daphne admits that looking for her real parents have brought up feelings of abandonment. Velma starts immediately making this about her by bringing up her own missing mom, but Daphne interrupts her and says that when Velma's mom went missing, Velma abandoned her too. Velma really is tallying up those likeable, quirky main character points, isn't she? Manipulative, self-centered, self-righteous, sees friendship as transactional, self-deflecting, self-serving. Honestly, the real mystery is why everyone who's watched this show hates her. She's just not like other girls, you guys. Daphne says that she really liked kissing Velma, but when Velma said she wasn't attracted to her, she freaked out and thought she was going to get abandoned again. Velma admits that she liked kissing Daphne, but is still really attracted to Fred. Daphne jokes that Velma really does need therapy, and although this is true, I am once again like, are these characters not aware that bisexuals exist? Velma and Daphne decide to just be friends, and it's clear it's not going to work because they're really hung up on each other. Velma is furious to see Norville isn't there to drive her home. Now I have to walk! I have literally never been madder. Hi, Dad. Meanwhile, the prison's been set on fire. Norville finds a business card for a mental institution in his dad's cardigan as a cliffhanger for the next episode, and our after credit sequence are the prisoners getting rounded up by the cops again, except for Fred's cellmate who manages to get away, and that is it for this first part. Good lord, what a mess. What an unlikable, bitter, hateful mess. Since I mentioned it on my community tab that I am watching and re-watching Velma for this review, I've had people commenting with condolences for my mental health, saying just how awful they found the show themselves, or just general messages of Good speed, brave soldier. But one comment was left which I think I'm just going to read out as it is to close this first part because this person put it so succinctly. They seem to think that the characters being cruel and awful to everyone around them is a joke and that we should be on their side for it. At least with High Guardian Spies, it felt like the writers were just really bad at what they were doing for the most part. It always felt more general incompetence, even for the actually unpleasant parts. Here, it seems like genuine maliciousness. Like the writers were so cynical and jaded that they couldn't even comprehend the idea that people could actually un ironically like Scooby-Doo. So they had to go out of their way to rip apart everything someone could enjoy about the original and leave a soulless, mean-spirited husk in its wake. But we have more to talk about, so hit me up in part 2 where we'll cover, well, more of the same, really. And if it achieves nothing but saving you the pain of actually watching this show, then it'll have been a worthwhile endeavor, I guess. Being popular on Twitter isn't about charm or wit. It's about being as inflammatory as possible. We start off with Velma giving us her character introduction, where she all but says, I'm not like other girls, before there's an announcement that another girl has been found murdered. It seems like they got tired of the whole murder reveal thing, because the discovery of the third victim happens off screen. At a, what do you call this, press conference, I guess? The mayor announces that since the new girl was murdered while Fred was in jail, he has been exonerated. Are there any more questions? Yeah, I have one. How come no one ever cared this much about my missing mom? Velma's character remains consistent by trying to spin every situation into being all about her. What they should be holding a press conference for is the mysterious disappearance of the Scooby-Doo characters because they sure as hell aren't in this show. At approximately 1400 hours, state and federal authorities uncovered a duffel bag in the woods. Said bag contains 24 hours of Scooby-Doo episodes. Excuse me, what, what episodes? The Spacey Space Kook? Which which yes, is which? Yes, all of them. 
who I'm guessing is the sheriff, just because he looks like Tommy Lee Jones by way of George Bush Jr., says they have had a breakthrough in the case by all three murder victims being hot. I would like to reaffirm that the third murder victim has up until this point not been named, shown, or given any details about to the audience. It's like they got bored or something, which I'd believe because it's clear by now that these writers really hate this show and these characters. And HBO thought this was the show to try and win some good faith after they completely dropped the ball, tripped on their laces, and face planted into the nearest dumpster when, I would like everyone to know, Unicorn Warriors Eternal has just been sitting there. Do you guys have any idea what it's like to watch Velma knowing how good Unicorn Warriors is? You guys better watch Unicorn Warriors when it comes out. I want my season two. From the mind of Gendy Tartakovsky comes a new animated series, a lifetime in the making. Unicorn Warriors Eternal. Anyway, getting back to HBO's backwash. Because of funding problems, instead of trying to protect every hot teenage girl in town, the police want to rank the five hottest girls and will be giving them a police escort. Not to bring real-world US politics into this too much, but this seems really at odds with the show's angle. Isn't one of the major criticisms of the American police force that they are overfunded and should not have so much money they can afford military-grade weapons? And as much as this show likes to joke about the lack of school funding, which is a real concern, doesn't their ACAB stance in this case conflict with their own plot? This is a small detail, but I think it's just like the weird Tumblr diatribe I went into in the first part. It shows a level of insincerity from the writers and how they're once again trying to wear the skin of a progressive millennial or Gen Z kid, but has absolutely no personal connection to any of these issues. In episode 3, Velma asks why the girls have to attend self-defense classes when the boys don't have to attend don't kill girl classes and the principal says due to terrible school funding she can't afford to try and undo centuries of toxic masculinity which is not what toxic masculinity is but we'll give up trying to slay that dragon today so the show makes a joke about the lack of funding in high schools as being the core problem okay but then for the sake of the plot in this episode the cops are also underfunded so are they saying the US should give the cops more funding? This is why if you're trying to make a satire, you should have some knowledge about the topic you are satirizing. Wait, so a couple of middle-aged white dudes are gonna decide which of us are hottest? Okay, so how long before they make a joke about that's what Facebook was made for? Because I'm already bored by the reference and they haven't even made it yet. Fine. So don't forget that ranking hot girls is exactly how the Trojan War and Facebook started. Uh, there it is. Also, damn it, you could have just said the Trojan War. That was funny. You had a funny joke and you killed it. <sighs> so through shenanigans of her mouthing off at this whole thing, Velma has to be the person who is going to rank the five hottest girls in school who will get a police bodyguard. Daphne runs over to thank Velma for agreeing to make the list, they hug, and Daphne reminds us that Velma and her agreed to just stay friends. I know I'm the wrong person to make this observation, but I am completely baffled by the concept of, oh we were terrible as friends and our friendship doesn't work and is awful, so let's become romantic partners instead. Is is that how that works? Is is that a thing? Is that, that how that thing works? Help me out here, hello friends. What are you doing? I'm ending our friendship. Daphne reveals she has finally made enough money to hire a personal investigator to help her track down her parents. Velma, for the first time, decides that she's annoyed that Daphne doesn't try and hire her because she's a detective but Daphne says Velma has enough on her plate and their relationship is messed up enough already. This is probably a good call because so far Velma has proven to be a terrible detective. Most often ignoring evidence in favor of bias confirmation. Velma immediately tries to bum off the hot girl list onto Daphne because Velma can't think of the other girls as hot because compared to Daphne, they're all hideous to her. See. 
personal bias interfering with investigation and critical thinking. One, I hate making lists, and two, oh no, this is a list. Okay, that one was funny. Good job, show. You've made two jokes that work so far. Olivia interrupts, letting them know that the various girls at school are ready to do anything to get on the hot girl list. You know, all four of the pre-established girls. I wonder who's gonna end up on the list. We're then treated to a montage of the popular girls trying to hoe it up for Velma so they can get picked. I haven't been playing it because of copyright, but so far every episode of Velma has had Summer of the Pop song in it. When I got to this episode, I remember thinking to myself that this show is so on the nose and trite, it wouldn't be out of character for them to start playing Feel Like a Woman by Shania Twain. Let's go, girl! After one of the hot girls causes an accident involving the school band, Norval comes to Velma to tell her to make the damn list already. Velma says she's struggling and this is the first time she's had enough time to focus. Also, Velma is in the school band. By the way, this is a newly introduced fact in this episode. And the hot girls are distracting because you recently came out and get too turned on to focus? Got it, copied. You know, at the start of this show, I was willing to categorize Norville in the same level as Fred, where he's not likable, but he's a step above the other main characters. But no, Norville's just as awful as Velma and Daphne. He's just awful in a far less aggressive or overt way. Oh geez, how do I even summarize the next dialogue exchange? <sighs> I'm just gonna tell you so we can move on because it's such a barrage of awful all at once, it makes me feel like I'm fighting Kenshiro. Velma says she can't make the list because she likes Daphne. Norville comments about Velma being gay. Velma says she's not gay because she also likes Fred because, again, this show seems weirdly resistant to the concept of bisexuals. Norval asks how Velma would explain Daphne's personality so that he can emulate it so he can get Velma to like him instead. Velma says this is the problem with men, they make everything about what they want. Norval says, Not me, I'm an ally. Velma then says girls are taught from childhood what being attractive is and she's not it. She then says, Every little kid knows how to draw a penis, but make a little kid draw a vagina and what happens? You go to jail? You know what, let's skip the rest of the scene and move on, shall we? Velma meets up with Fred so she can ask him to help her with the list. Fred agrees because he correctly identifies this as charity work and how it can help him repair his public image. Yes. This is another joke which honestly could have worked if they didn't try to do too much with it. They made Fred's little savant moment here too over the top with his final reaction. They should have had this part. Yes, yes. And then after this build up, have him write the list in a matter of seconds and hand it back to Velma with a simple done. The joke is Fred is such an idiot savant at recognizing when a girl is hot but they've confused it by adding this ending, which then makes the joke, Fred Jones is a savant at recognizing hot girls, so he can do it really fast. And also, this really fast deduction has him acting like he just exerted himself. The joke should either be, he is a genius at this very stupid thing, so he can do it quickly, or Fred exhausted himself over something that is incredibly mentally taxing when it's something as stupid as ranking hot girls. You can't do the joke both ways. It overcomplicates it and kills both punchlines. Velma thanks Fred. <laughs> okay, no. Velma says goodbye to Fred and hands him a book on feminism because he kind of needs it. Yeah, okay, I'm not going to complain about that too much. We cut back to Daphne. Look, kid, I know you want to find your biological parents, but as my name makes clear, I'm too short and too high to be useful. What an oddly handled reference. Daphne's moms have locked her inside her room for her own safety, but shove Norville in as he's come to try and mimic her personality so that he can get Velma to date him. A rock comes flying through Daphne's window. Norville mentions it's not a rock, but a geode from the town's tourist attraction, a crystal mine that has since been abandoned. 
We cut back to Velma, who hands in the list and makes a pissy comment about how this whole hot girl murder thing is about the patriarchy or something. I don't know. It's stupid and completely incorrect in how the majority of serial killer psychology works. But it doesn't matter because Velma doesn't really care about facts. She just looks for every opportunity to make comments like this and, again, we're supposed to think Velma is a good detective when she can't even get basic criminology correct because she'd rather complain about topical issues. The mayor has an epiphany that instead of wasting money on a police escort, Velma is so awful and unlikable that if they can get the hot girls to be like her, they'd be safe from the serial killer. This would also be a funny joke at the expense of how awful Velma is, but instead we have to listen to Velma spin this into Oh boy, I get to release these superficial shallow girls from the sexist role of the male gaze or whatever. Look, I don't have to explain this too much because you already know what Velma's angle is going to be here because, again, this show is so paint by numbers. <laughs> it's so boring, guys. This show didn't offend or enrage me because how can I get angry at a show who doesn't believe its own dogma and is only doing the things it is to rile up its audience? But the level of boredom I experienced throughout this thing was genuinely painful. I have ADHD. I don't do well with boring. The hot girls minus Daphne show up at Velma's house for what the show is calling a go lessons despite Velma's protests and I am genuinely confused why they didn't instead sell this as a makeover joke. Like just do all the tropes of a makeover turning a girl with glasses hot but in reverse. It's an obvious joke but it's weird the show didn't lean into it and instead did, well, nothing really. They ping pong back and forth between it being reclaim your feminine power, but like in a shallow Instagram kind of way, and a be ugly and annoying, which is a lot more accurate to Velma's personality. Again, it's just a very confused joke that doesn't have a solid structure to it. The show writers know you know what this is, so it just takes for granted you already know what the joke is supposed to be, so they don't actually need to tell it. It's very weird and difficult to explain unless you've watched these episodes yourself, which I don't recommend doing. Meanwhile, Fred has read the entire book on the feminine mystique and is annoyed it didn't include any sexy shapeshifters, which, I don't know, is, is weirdly valid? <laughs> I know it's a bad joke, but it made me nod and go, yeah, I hate it when people mistag their fix or something. <laughs> Maybe I'm just desperate for something I can relate to. The feminist book has had a horrible effect on Fred though, as suddenly he finds himself more attracted to uh, real women, I guess. We cut back to Velma's house. Oh my god, I was joking. Anyway, makeover time. We see Olivia sneak away to put on some makeup because, get this, dressing the way I do doesn't make her feel good about herself. It's almost like some girls get their confidence and self-fulfillment by accentuating their femininity instead of basing their personal identity on the opinions of others. Makeup is for women who want husbands. Contouring is for women who want to leech the souls of their dead lovers. Replacing please love me, I need your approval to have confidence with please hate me, I need your scorn to have confidence is a lateral move, Velma. You're still hinging your own self-worth on outsider opinion. You've just traded unobtainable acceptance with easier to obtain hatred. You've not fixed the problem. This is all just like empty movement. Norville and Daphne have arrived at the historical society to learn more about their town's crystal mines. We learn that Crystal Cove had a huge financial boom in the 70s when holistic crystal belief reached new heights thanks to the New Age movement. But by the 1980s, the crystal fad ended, replaced by the aerobics fad and the cocaine fad. Damn it. <laughs> That's actually a really good joke. Daphne feels like she's been to the crystal mines before and wonders if her parents might be tied to the mines somehow and drags Norville along to go see for herself. Velma is all smug and ready to reveal her makeover of the hot girls but is dismayed when she pulls off the sheet and see they'd all gone back to looking as they always do. 
This wasn't an exercise in deprogramming. It's an exercise in slut shaming. No woman should ever have to change who she is or how she dresses to not be murdered. You think every girl deep down is like you, but you're wrong. In fact, your definition of womanhood is even more restrictive than ours. Yes, drag her, Olivia, drag her. This was honestly one of the most satisfying moments in the show for me. But, um, what was the point of all of this? To point out Velma as a terrible person with an extremely narrow view on feminism? Well, she's the main character, so you'd think they'd point this out so Velma can undergo some kind of change? I mean, why else challenge your main title character's moral opinions and then do nothing more with it? This isn't The Godfather where we're gonna watch somebody go down a downward spiral or something. Velma completely misses the point and has no idea how to have any concept of self removed from outside opinions and so freaks out because she doesn't know how she can present herself as a progressive feminist to other people. Sophie is so desperate to end this talking point she goes into labor. Velma has to try and clear the cars out of the carpool lane so the ambulance can get to her, but drawing attention to Sophie being in labor causes a crowd to form. There's a really stupid and very confused thing where Velma and the hot girls go back and forth about how they individually express their femininity as self-confidence, except this show really doesn't know how to articulate that conversation, so instead we get a lot of this. Just like how you're all women who don't want to own shorts that cover your butt, I'm a woman who doesn't want to own it. The writers are clearly ill-equipped to try and have this discussion, which is funny because don't let others' opinions define you is something I'm pretty sure the Care Bears covered at one point. Just because you're aiming for scorn instead of approval doesn't change anything. You're still clearly struggling with your self-identity and basing it on outside opinion. See, when you know what the core problem is, it's not that hard to put into words. However, I suspect that this show is so terrible at grasping this concept because you can never get someone's approval so instead you settle for getting their scorn because at least it's acknowledgement is the exact toxic mindset that these show writers themselves are living in when they made this. So when they got to this point in the episode's writing, they were unable to face that mirror and floundered in how to resolve this conflict because they were too afraid of the self-reflection that this demands. So instead, they settled on some flimsy, both our opinions are valid thing, when in fact the hot girls are fully embracing their hotness because it makes them feel good about themselves regardless of what others think. And Velma rejects conventional beauty because she wants other people to view her as a progressive, not like other girls feminist. Both those things are valid. Yeah, sure, Velma writers, keep telling yourself that. I'm sure that your reliance on other people's disapproval will do wonders for your long-term happiness and fulfillment. The hot girls do a, uh, sexy dance and lead the crowd away so the ambulance can get closer while Velma beats the shit out of people because that is the counterpoint to using your attractiveness to your advantage. Fred spots her through his car window and immediately crashes on her thanks to the feminist book he read, which tells me he must have read one of those feminist books which are like weirdly aggressive about it. Daphne and Norville are at the Crystal Mines and Daphne gives lip service to being different to everyone else because she has a high risk personality. Norville doesn't want to go into the mines with Daphne because he hates danger and convinces her to go home. Essentially, Daphne's entire point in this episode was to stand on the stage and explain her character motivations to us instead of having to show any of it. They just peppered it throughout the episode so it wouldn't be as boring as it actually is. You'd think they'd try and establish this personality in the previous episodes, and although they kind of did with Daphne selling drugs, they made it out like that was a means to an end to get money, and was not something that tied to her having a reckless personality. So they tried show, failed at it, and then settled for tell. Sophie had a little girl. I really hope my little girl grows up to be just like you. But why? Fred shows up at Velma's house and we do that thing I showed in part 1 where Fred is now attracted to Velma, but for reasons of narrative convenience she no longer finds him attractive. I didn't skip anything, she just stopped liking him at some point in this episode. 
Our mid credit scene is one of the hot girls, Gigi, experimenting with her looks since she realized she did feel more confident in Velma's non-makeover and she's combined it with her hot girl aesthetic into something new. This is worth mentioning because Gigi becomes a major character after this episode. She bumps into Norville and the show sets up that they'll get together. The episode starts with Velma actually doing something relatable for once in that she's freaking out because her friends aren't responding to her texts immediately. But rather than her having a meltdown because she thinks her friends hate her, which granted they probably do, instead she's just angry because her panic attacks have gotten so bad she can't even look at her conspiracy board without triggering one. So she needs Norville to do all the hard work for her. Why have the hallucinations suddenly gotten worse? Shut up. Velma complains to her dad to give her a lift to school because her simp still isn't answering her. Her dad rather clumsily works into the conversation that he's going to be at the hospital that evening to have a baby photo shoot with Sophie. Velma for some reason thinks she's in danger of the serial killer despite us just last episode establishing they only kill hot girls to the point of modeling them after Velma was guaranteed safety. So I have no idea why any of this is here. Yeah, this is going to be one of those episodes where completely senseless plot points happen and the only justification is because of the reason. Velma is looking for Norville at school and there's a joke about her not even knowing what his eye color is because she has such little value in him as a human being, let alone her friend. And this is funny because bitter nastiness is the height of comedy as far as these writers are concerned. I would like to point out that Mindy has said she wanted the character of Velma to basically be herself in suits, so that's something. The mayor and sheriff, ah so he is the sheriff, this show is nothing yet predictable, come on to the intercom to let know the police security given to the hot girls are no longer a thing because the cops keep getting sexually harassed by the underage girls. I'm sure there's a joke in there somewhere. Anyway, instead of the security detail, there is now going to be a 9pm curfew because it's more convenient for this episode's plot. Velma runs into Fred. She's still looking for Norval to be at her beck and call, but Fred is now hopelessly infatuated with her and wants to prove he'd be a far better minion. Saying that he believes her about her mom's disappearance being something bigger than her just running away if that will get Velma to pay attention to him. Which it does. However, despite Velma's claims in the prologue of the first episode that Fred and his weird sex van was not the person to start Mysteries Inc and it was actually her, Fred is the one who has been doing some investigating into Velma's mom's disappearance and has found among his dad's papers that their house used to be owned by a woman named Dr. Edna Pardue, a neurologist who died in an insane asylum after conducting unethical experiments. Reminder that Velma's investigation into her mother's disappearance has so far included um I think my mom loved me so she wouldn't have run away and yeah that's pretty much it. I guess that can't be helped when you have a panic attack every time you try to investigate a mystery. I don't think you as a show can really try and sell a character as being a good detective when she is mentally incapable of doing any investigation without a potentially fatal meltdown. And then also have her shown up by the character you have made an effort to paint as the stupidest one in the main cast who you also want to use as a punching bag. Hey, show? The character you hate and want us to point and laugh at is doing a better job than your sociopathic self-insert. Anyway, Fred drops the line that Norval is unavailable because he's most likely making out with his girlfriend. And Velma reacts outraged to hear Norval has a girlfriend without her knowing about it. So again, Fred is shown as being better at gathering information than her. He doesn't even give a crap about Norval but somehow knows about his and Gigi's hookup despite Velma asking around for Norval at school literally all day. I am genuinely impressed as to how you can do the exact opposite of what you're trying to paint your character as. I haven't seen a character this badly executed since… Let's just move on. We get a good joke which they then kill by belaboring it after its punchline, but for the smallest sliver of a second I was amused. Norville, you have a girlfriend? No. And your girlfriend is Gigi? Damn, this makes me think I could bag Don Lemon. 
Anyway, Gigi has reinvented her image from prep, as Enerby Darkness Dementia Raven Way would call it, and instead go for quote unquote artsy hot, which is not what this aesthetic is at all, but whatever. The show has gotten bored with the bastardized Scooby Doo characters and has decided it wanted to include a new character for them to write about instead. This will become far more evident as we go on, as Gigi becomes a secondary main character and is possibly the least hateful out of the entire cast. Gigi's design is really good though, genuinely a big fan of how this character looks. Velma, it turns out, is very happy Norval has a girlfriend because it means Velma can do even less emotional labor and just call Norval whenever she wants him to do her bidding while Gigi can listen to him, you know, talk about his feelings and interests. However, immediately proving herself to be a better person than anyone we've run into so far, Gigi says that Norval has no self-confidence, so as his girlfriend, she is the one who is saying Norval should spend less time with Velma and learn to build up his self-worth. Velma pouts and throws a passive-aggressive tantrum, saying how she can use Fred instead. Fred is more than happy to offer whatever help he can. Velma, give me the chance and I can help you with anything. Except filling in your ethnicity on a form. I'm guessing Samoan? It's okay, Fred. When I watched this the first time, I had absolutely no idea what ethnicity Velma is either. Like I said before, I really don't care and find it very weird that the show seems so hyper-focused on Velma's race for some reason. Yeah, 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 I, I know, America, whatever. I get this is a cultural difference because I'm watching an American show when I'm not American myself. But it doesn't change the fact that as a result, I just genuinely didn't know Velma's skin color was something I should see as something worth focusing so hard on. We cut to Daphne sneaking out of her room because I assume she's still under lock and key and bikes to the crystal mines. When she gets there, a shadow figure from inside the boarded entrance grabs her and pulls her inside. Her attacker is revealed to be some people wearing Captain Caveman mascot suits who claim to be her parents. Much to her shock because she's so brain dead she thinks the costumes are real. I don't really understand why these crystal minds have Captain Caveman as their mascot. Other than the writers of this show wanted to make a passing reference to another Hanna-Barbera character and had absolutely zero talent on how to do that in a way that makes sense. Scoob did this so much better. Daphne wants to be angry at her parents for abandoning her, but they tell her she was stolen as a baby before they disappear after making a Netscape comment. Fun fact, Netscape evolved into Firefox, which is what all of you should be using for internet security and safety. And this has been your PSA for the video. Velma and Fred are going to the Historical Society to find any information on Dr. Pardue. I'm a little confused as to why Velma thinks this information has anything to do with her missing mom, but I guess you can kind of justify it as Fred's house was the last place her phone was pinged from. It's just not very clearly explained and the show doesn't think anybody watching it would actually be interested in the mystery. I mean, I'm not, but you could at least try. It turns out Dr. Pardue's journals, which were at the society, are missing and the last person to check them out was Velma's mom. This causes Velma to have a panic attack. Quick, make me laugh like Norville would have. I, I would, but all I can think of right now is the gender pay gap. Is it funny? Women make 20% less than men, and women of color even less? <laughs> I can't stop laughing. We don't have a wage gap in my country. Velma almost dies, but unfortunately is revived. She and Fred go to the malt shop where Velma is now upset that Norval has a girlfriend because Fred has proven himself not useful to her so she sees no value in him. She decides she has to break up Norval and Gigi and I'm sure all of you were just confused as to why it took so long for Velma to decide to do so because it's exactly the kind of narcissistic move she is likely to pull. There was like a plot point about banned sleepover being cancelled but it's back on so I didn't bother mentioning it. Fred shows up, although he's not allowed to come inside because he's not a band member, but he still really wants to help Velma. She wants to tell him to get lost, but it turns out she didn't bother thinking that the band members might need food for the sleepover. So Fred jumps in to save the day, saying he'll get them pizza. Daphne is googling the crystal mines and finds out that the people she met are all former employees from when it was a tourist attraction, and after it went bust, formed a sort of mole people society who robbed the surface world for the resources they need. 
It turns out the gang were apprehended by her moms and she was the only infant member who they then adopted. Genetically, I'm a villain. No wonder I'm attracted to a girl who looks like a little henchman. Norval is dropped off for the band meeting and Daphne shows up to try and talk to Velma. She wants to tell Velma about her birth parents, but because Velma doesn't care about anyone but herself, she ignores what Daphne has to say. So Daphne tells Norval instead. But despite Norval being eager to hear the details, Velma pulls him away because she wants him to help her find her mom instead. Honestly, this is another reason why this show is so disliked by people. Despite the myriad of other reasons the show is disliked by people. But it's not just that the characters are unlikable and unfunny, so you can't even laugh at them, but their unlikable characteristics are just so tiring to sit through. It's like when you stumble into an internet fight you have nothing to do with, and you think it might be entertaining to watch as an outsider, but instead of being unhinged crazy, it's just two people repeating the exact same reason they hate each other on loop, so you just get bored and exhausted after a while. Velma manages to get Norville to agree to help her with at least one clue. And, shocker, this show delivers another joke which is actually funny. But make it fast. It sounds like Gigi just got here. Gigi? Gigi and Velma have a flute off to decide who gets to occupy Norville's time. Anyway, the nerds are starting to get antsy about the lack of food because literally all of them need to take their meds. Velma is trying to talk Gigi into sharing Norval with her and Gigi lets slips that Norval has something going on with his family, but she can't tell Velma what. Velma pretends she already knows what Gigi is talking about to find out Edna Pardu is Norval's grandmother because, once again, this show is written like a soap opera where everyone is distantly related or involved with everyone else. Fred arrives with the pizza, pizza, bumps into Norval, and the pizza gets run over by the sheriff. The nerds are by now going feral because this show, which is so concerned with presenting itself as progressive and hip with the kids despite not understanding any of the things it's talking about, thought it would be a good idea to make fun of people who take medication for the sake of an unfunny joke. Good job, guys. The gang decide to get food from the malt shop, but Fred points out only cops are allowed past curfew. Since Daphne lives next door, they plan to take her mom's car, but Norville is the only one who drives, so Velma does this. In light of the recent revelation I take advantage of you, I couldn't expect you to do this for me. So, oh well, it was almost a good idea. Guess my house will just get destroyed. I'm just showing you the clip because once again, it might look like I'm exaggerating things just because I dislike her, but no, this is really what the show is like. Norval agrees to drive and Velma is tasked to get the keys from Daphne. Daphne wants to talk to Velma about her parents because she's freaking out, but Velma promises that if Daphne messages her what the problem is, she'll be sure to give it a thumbs up by Monday and they drive off not even taking Daphne despite her saying last episode that her character is apparently based on high risk behavior. But the car speeding off opens up a manhole and Daphne crawls down it to find a boat waiting for her. I want to write an IOU for the food. There's no time. You'll get caught. Sorry, I have no choice. I mean, if we don't support a small business owned by a woman of color, who will? Wow, Norville. You're not just a better friend than I am. You're a better person. No. Wait. Yes. Being a better person than Velma is not exceptionally hard. Norville isn't, though. <laughs> The sheriff is patrolling outside the malt shop and Velma agrees to distract him while the others get back to her house with the food. In the cop car, she finds Norval's mom and dad who have been... You know what, I don't really want to know. And Velma uses it as an opportunity to blackmail Norval's mom for information on Edna Pardu. I just realized that throughout this entire show, Velma's investigation technique always boils down to manipulating other people into doing what she wants. Anyway, band is fed, house is cleaned by band, Velma's dad, Sophie and new baby arrive, Daphne meets her real parents in the cave. And that's it for the episode. I feel I should give some comment on what sort of impression it gave me, but this episode is so much mush, I genuinely can't even say if it left any impression on me other than I think Gigi looks cool and Fred is becoming more likable as we go, which I think is the opposite of what the writers wanted. Wait, wasn't Velma supposed to break up Norval and Gigi or something? 
If there's one thing teen dramas get right, it's that nothing is ever actually a teenager's fault. We're all really just paying for the sins of our parents. If this is something the creators believe, that would explain a lot. Also, mark it off your bingo cards because this is where I do my per video mention of The Breakfast Club. So Valma's point to this little it's not my fault I'm like this, my parents just don't understand me speech is that Velma says her dad is the worst parent ever. And normally I would take this as a typical teenager complaining about how their parents suck, but because this is Velma and she's so vocal about everything she thinks is bad, this show's writing leads me to believe that she really thinks this. So that's fun for me. The main problem is her dad can't take her to school because he and Sophie are taking maternity leave and going hiking, leaving Velma to walk to school. Fred stops next to her, asking her if she'd like to ride in his fully stocked limo, because whereas Norville's attempts at trying to win Velma's affection was guilting her into dating him, trying to use her panic attacks as justification for kissing her and imitating the personality of the person Velma likes, Fred's methods of trying to get Velma's attention is to buy food for her when she forgot, do investigation into her mom's disappearance so he can give her clues to work with, and offer to give her a ride when he sees she doesn't have one. Truly, Fred is the horrible, privileged, rich boy who deserves to be humiliated and injured as a source of comedy while Norville gets a hot girlfriend. Anyway, Fred's dad says Velma isn't allowed to ride with them, although he doesn't really say why. Velma has a moment of reflection that her dad isn't that bad, only for the show to have her dad drive past and splash mud on her. Velma is asking Norval's mom, the principal, about her mother, Dr. Pardue, and Norval is there to try and quell Velma's hallucinations. I'm not sure why the principal can't just do it herself, but whatever. The show also tries to make it sound like Gigi is basically just as bad as Velma when she throws out a passive aggressive comment to Norville about not fixing her pants fast enough, but if you think this is gonna be a thing that leads somewhere, it doesn't. Okay, so what follows is a bunch of backstory on Dr. Pardue, which is gonna be important to the mystery, which the show can't decide whether it should be something the audience cares about or not. So in the 70s, Dr. Pardue figured out how to keep a human brain alive after it's been removed from the body. There are so many references I could put here. But oh, jeez, which one do I go with? Mystery Science Theater? Men just never listen. <laughs> oh, I get it. It was a comedy. Yeah. Or Timmy and the T-Rex. Yeah! Oh! Sometimes my job is incredibly difficult. Anyway, an army guy wants to use this brain swap thing because he sees the biggest threat to American society is meddling kids. Which in a better written Scooby-Doo show would actually be a clever way of working that into the plot. He wants to brain swap soldiers with young people and stop them from protesting the Vietnam War. Except this show doesn't have the guts to actually mention the Vietnam War, so it just makes it about young people protesting that war is bad in a general sense. There's a plot point about the general trying to use hypnosis before the brain swap thing, but it only worked if nobody ever snapped their fingers. This is a very dumb sentence, as you can tell, but it's actually plot relevant, so I have to mention it. Also, the army guy's name is General Meeting, which as far as army name puns go is pretty weak. Private thoughts? I'd rather not say, sir. How about you, major exclamation? Great googly moogly! Oh, also... He called the program the Special Covert Operations Brain Initiative, or Scooby. Scooby? And wait, what did Scooby do? Yeah, so Scooby-Doo is not a character in this Scooby-Doo show. Actually, come to think of it, if Scooby and Shaggy were angry at Matthew Lillard's portrayal in the live action movie, maybe they took one look at the script for Velma and flatly refused to be involved. I am choosing to believe this is the reason for this baffling decision not to have Scooby-Doo in your Scooby-Doo cartoon because it's the only one I can think of that actually makes sense. Scooby-Dooby-Doo, we're missing you! Isn't any fun without ya? Anyway, Dr. Pardue cracked under pressure, bricked up her lab and handed herself over to a mental institution where she eventually died. Playing God, removing brains, that's some white people shit. You humans are all racist. 
Velma says that maybe a mad scientist who can remove brains could be connected to the serial murders in which all three girls had their brains removed. I mean, I assume the third victim had her brain removed. We never saw her on screen, never heard how she was killed, how she was found, what her name was, what the condition of the discovery of the crime was, nothing. In a better story, you might try and work this into being some sort of clue that the third murder is a red herring made by someone other than the serial killer to throw the police off the trail. But Velma manages to subvert expectations by just having it be sloppy lazy writing. You're actually a pretty good detective. Compared to what? The principal tries to give Velma something that she says is the key to solving this mystery, but the second she opens the box, Velma has a hallucination. While that's going on, Daphne is still hanging out with the Crystal Mine Mole people, and we find out that Daphne's dad is just using her because he needs her for something. And scene. Back with Velma, they jabbed her with an adrenaline shot. Again, why was Norval here? The principal refuses to help Velma anymore because she wants the only remaining adrenaline shot for her shellfish allergy because she wants to eat shrimp for lunch. Which is not me being facetious, that's an actual reason the show gives us. But after begging the principal to tell her anything that might lead her to her mom's disappearance, the principal tries to tell her some information, triggering another panic attack. I also want to point out that we don't get any cool animation this time as both hallucinatory episodes just cut to black. Velma is caught in a problem loop because she won't stop having hallucinations until she finds her mom, but trying to solve her mom's mystery causes the hallucinations. Norval asks her why her hallucinations only started on the day Velma went up to her mom's car when she had tried to solve her mom's disappearance before then, which is not a story detail ever mentioned before. And even typing it out now in the script, I have no idea if I clearly understand what he means here. This feels a lot like the writers making the plot up as they went, and when they stumbled into plot holes like this, which doesn't match the solution to the mystery they finally decided upon, they have to introduce previously unmentioned details to have the ending make sense. And not in a revealing more of the mystery way, but in a Oh, that moment we've seen before of Velma having her first hallucination after starting her investigation into her mom? Yeah, she was totally looking for her mom before that. No, we have repeatedly used this flashback to show Velma getting involved with this mystery, but we swear she was investigating it before this moment. We may not have any footage of it, but it totally happened, trust us. So, get this. Velma spontaneously decides that her hallucinations are triggered because she wants her dad's love, but he always acts dismissive when she mentions her mom's disappearance. So clearly, the hallucinations are her psyche trying to stop her from pushing her dad further away. How much do you want to bet Velma does something to try and remedy this and then declares her hallucinations cured? Anyway, then we get into... Even though he's the one who basically taught you to be a beta? Oh no. Excuse me? My father is not a beta. Oh no. Please don't tell me this is going to be the running joke this episode. Because heavy lifting is exactly what alphas like us do. Thanks. We're helping your mom's old boyfriend move. with Daphne, she's doing some bonding with her real parents and they tell her that they turned to real crime because after the mine went bankrupt, they couldn't get the same criminal high they got from charging unsuspecting people obscene amounts of money for holistic crystals. The dad ominously says that Daphne's moms are gonna pay before joking that he meant pay for crystals because due to feelings of global insecurity, believing in crystals is back in fashion. I would have to ask an expert on how true this is. Daphne's parents are planning to get rich off the crystal market and then move to Angola. This upsets Daphne as she's just made a reconnection with them. Say yes and we'll tell you why you have orange hair. Oh my god, yes! I smoke during pregnancy, like a lot. Like I should be dead. Oh. This is another weird thing. This show has been lampshading the fact that Daphne has orange hair, which is weird because they've changed her race to Asian. 
So they keep mentioning it like they're already worried people are gonna nitpick this detail. Instead, I'm going to nitpick their defensiveness because I don't understand why they're so insecure about this detail. It's 2023. Having a non-natural hair color is almost the norm these days. Yeah. Hmm? Body body da. Come on. I can't decide if this is the 30 to 40 year old writers having no idea what young people fashion is like these days, or if it's just another case of the writer's complete lack of self-confidence that they think lampshading this fact in a self-deprecating way will get people not to criticize it. The result is I am criticizing their insecurity instead, so nothing has been gained or lost from this detail other than what little brain cells I have left. Velma wants to talk to her dad and he is all too happy to get away from taking care of the baby. They go to somewhere at the diner, which is not the malt shop, confusingly enough, which they would always go to when Velma was a kid. Except, now it's a strip club. Sophie told me I can't pee in the shower anymore because that's where she bathes Amanda. Now I have to pee in the shower at school like a weirdo. Pro tip, aim for the drain, she'll never know. Oh, I'll try that. Do I need to be here for this? Velma's dad is constantly distracted by wanting to focus on his job instead of Velma, or Sophie for that matter, and walks out of the club to take a call which upsets Velma. Oh, so you're going to work, are you? Well then call me Ernest Shackleton, because I'm headed to a poll. Okay, this may not have made me laugh like the guillotine did, but I'm going to call this the best line in the whole show. Anyway, Fred's there but gets dragged off by his dad so quickly I don't even know why I'm bothering to mention it. Velma starts a very pathetic attempt at a pole dance. What are you doing up there? I'm doing what every girl is doing up here. I'm just trying to get my dad's attention. And one day it will work. And now this totally progressive show has made fun of people who rely on medication for their health and said that the only reason someone would go into adult entertainment is because they have daddy issues. I'm not even someone who gets bent out of shape about this sort of thing. I just think it's important to point out the hypocrisy because it illustrates how fake and disingenuous these show writers are. Don't make me play the Daria clip again. Honestly though, this show wishes it was Daria. It begs for us to treat it like Daria. Daria was also heavily focused on a misanthropic teenage main character who tended to be rather obnoxious and how heavily she would criticize everything and everyone around her, while also being extremely self-aware that our main character's behavior and personality made her somewhat unlikable to everyone else. Quinn wears superficiality like a suit of armor because she's afraid of looking inside and finding absolutely nothing. And I'm so defended that I actively work to make people dislike me so I won't feel bad when they do. Can I go now? But you know what the two big differences are? The first is that Daria, despite its misanthropic shell, had a core of genuine emotion to it in what I saw described once as hesitantly hopeful. Although Daria would criticize those around her and have a lot to say about American society of the 90s, she was also often shown to have real human emotions and insecurities, which would come into play in a way where the character is forced to drop her shield for a few moments. And when she does do this, the show lets the Daria characters have their moment. And the other important reason is, Daria is actually funny. I need you to muster all your sexiness and lure everyone away with a sexy dance. Like a shimmy into a bouncy thing? I'm not a dancer. Just show me ass cheeks going in a different directions. And what? You'll just watch and silently judge us? Pass. But you have to distract Gary while I'm grabbing it. And just how am I supposed to do that, Mr. Phelps? You'll figure out something. Use your womanly attributes. Gotcha. I'll give birth. That'll work. Velma's dad says he's just told Sophie he's going to be spending more time with Velma as an excuse to get out of looking after the baby. We then get a montage showing the various teens hanging out with their parents set to the song Greatest Love of All by Whitney Houston because this show has a weird fetish for taking sincere expressions of joy and turning them into bitter hateful irony. Possibly because the writers have been working in the Hollywood film industry corporate world so long they have forgotten what real emotion in film is actually like. I know who I am. I'm your son. Oh my god! Oh my god! Anyway, Velma is hungover, Norval is ghosting Gigi because something something alpha male, and Fred's dad brought him a stripper to be his girlfriend. Turns out the person who helped Fred's dad figure out the legal junk to paying a woman for love was Velma's dad. 
This upsets her because she figures out he was only spending time with her so he can secretly work. Velma runs to get the box from the principal that gave her a hallucination earlier. Are you sure you won't hallucinate? Yes, my hallucinations were caused by my desire to make my dad love me. But after today, he's dead to me. And if I don't care what he thinks, then I won't hallucinate. And called it. That's what, the fourth time this has happened now? It seems it might actually have taken this time because Velma doesn't hallucinate when the principal explains that Velma's mom became interested in Dr. Parkley's mansion after the Joneses bought it. Because of the reason. Whatever caused this bizarre interest led Velma's mom to find out that Dr. Parkley's secret lab was still under the mansion. Yeah, none of the logic makes sense here. It's all just so the show can actually have a plot. The principal believes that Velma's mom was killed by Dr. Pardue's ghost, to which Velma has a quip about how only insert insult here believes in ghosts. Good job, show. You managed to have exactly one accurate character trait from the real Velma. Daphne goes back to the Crystal Mines to find everyone but her dad have already left. She begs him not to go and he pulls a gun on her, which would probably have been shocking if not for the fact that the show spelled out earlier that Daphne's dad is just using her, so this scene doesn't actually have any emotional punch to it. Daphne's dad was planning to use her as insurance so her adoptive moms won't come after them when they escape. But before anything can happen, Daphne's moms show up to save her and reveal that they've been on the gang's tail since Daphne's dad broke out of jail. We're maybe not the best cops, but we're great moms. Please enjoy this show floundering as it tries to have a critical opinion of cops while also positive representation of lesbians. Methinks you didn't really think these characters through when you built this self-congratulatory mess, did you? Anyway, Daphne's dad has a tank top in his pocket that belonged to one of the murdered girls, but he claims he just found it and something something recycling. Daphne's mom, who is also there, kicks one of the cops' camera, which causes the flash to go off and a swarm of bats to cause enough confusion for the gang to escape. Daphne is furious at her moms for using her to arrest the gang and lying about it, just like they lied about stealing her. However, her moms say they have never lied to her because they didn't steal her. She was left behind on purpose because her real parents didn't have enough room for her and their crystals when they escaped the first time. Another lie? The only thing we've ever lied to you about is the dog. That's why we never told you the truth. Norville's alpha male shtick, where he's been ignoring Gigi's calls, has caused him to miss her phoning him because she almost died from being attacked by bees, getting her pants out of the garbage where he threw it, because the nurse was out of adrenaline shots. This sequence of nonsense events are better constructed than the show's main mystery. Velma shows up at Fred's house and demands to see the secret lab in his basement. They find the lab still bricked up but Fred guesses one of the bricks would open the wall, but it just collapses on top of them. Velma's dad shows up and rescues her and Fred from the bricks and blah 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 something something, I just use work as a crutch after your mom left us. Look, this show has no interest in any of these characters having any real human emotion, so I don't feel the need to recount any of this empty lip service when it's not going to mean anything in the long run. Behind the bricks, they find a winding staircase that leads to the abandoned lab where they find fresh footprints and a paper that says Jinkies on it. Velma has another hallucination, begs her dad to believe her about her mom being kidnapped, he says he does, and the hallucination stops before we get any interesting animation to go with it. My hallucinations are finally over! Yeah, sure. Anyway, the Jinkies note was written in Velma's mom's handwriting. So if this was all about your dad believing you, how did making you laugh also stop your hallucinations? Right? Uh, the point is I don't know, but I'm sure I'll figure it out. It would be pretty lazy not to. Now come on! Okay, so you don't have any intention of actually explaining your fucking story. Thanks for broadcasting this and lampshading it as a joke so I don't have to waste time trying to make any of this make sense. See, this is what I mean when I say I'm not going to bother thinking about this too much and it doesn't really matter because so many things that they bring up, they'll immediately drop or be like, haha, it's funny that you cared about that, but you were wrong to invest in it. And it, it's, it gets so tiring to 
try and remember plot details and character quirks and character motivations only for the show itself to mock you for remembering these details. The episode ends with Daphne's mom finding a gold chain in the mines and then being attacked by someone we're led to believe is the serial killer. So that's it for episode 6. This middle stretch really does feel like the show treading water before it gets back to the main plot. However, when it does get back to the main plot, it treats it with such little relevance or importance and is completely inconsistent with how seriously it wants the audience to take any of this. Most team dramas these days are genuinely awful, according to Space Ninja, I don't actually watch them. But at least from what I can gather of those shows, the characters within them all treat the story they are currently in with a level of importance, even if it comes across as stupid, smug, pandering, or completely lacking in sense to the audience. But Velma constantly criticizes its own plot, its characters, and continuously breaks the pre-established rules which the show itself has put into place. On the first part, somebody pointed out that despite Clone High being incredibly silly and doing ridiculous things, Clone High established the rules of its universe that the show is stupid and ridiculous. So when stupid ridiculous things happen, we aren't thrown off by them because it's how the show presented itself and sticks to these rules. Velma, on the other hand, constantly sets up rules for its universe, then breaks them, then acts like they're important again, then abandons them completely, then sets up new rules for the universe only to break them again. And so you as the audience member has no idea how to feel about anything or anyone in the plot. Am I supposed to be invested in this mystery? Am I supposed to be invested in these characters? Am I supposed to take the mystery as something that has a solid construct to it? Am I supposed to swallow that the mystery itself is just a bunch of nonsense which is just there to put the characters in wacky situations? Is Vilma supposed to be a good detective or a detective that lets her hateful personality sabotage her? Is she supposed to be a hateful, unlikable character who everyone hates for understandable reasons? Or is she a genius who is just surrounded by people who don't understand her? Are we supposed to find her relatable or are we supposed to enjoy her suffering? Actually, let's talk about Velma's character a little before we go. I think we should keep searching for more clues. In Jello Apocalypse's video on why Fred is the best Scooby-Doo character, he points out that Velma is a difficult character to write. But I think I disagree. I think the truth is, show writers are just often really bad at writing the kind of character Velma is supposed to be. In the world of stereotypes, the smart nerd of a group is usually a dude is usually super annoying and usually has absolutely no social skills. Also, he's really good with computers and he really likes Star Trek or something along those lines. This was the stereotype for most of the 80s and 90s and probably early 2000s. Scooby-Doo came out just before the nerd stereotype was really cemented. So their smart nerd of the Mystery Inc. group was none of these things, but instead was Velma. Velma is originally portrayed as for lack of a better word, bookish. She is smart, but not to a comical level. She thinks very practically, has almost zero fear of ghosts, monsters, haunted houses, and honestly, probably murder. And although she shares duties with Fred on unmasking the bad guy at the end, she takes an active role in explaining how the gang figured out the mystery. Like Fred, she was also discarded for most of the late 80s and early 90s, before being brought back. In Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, she was portrayed pretty closely to her original incarnation in the small amount of screen time she gets. We see her now owning a mystery bookstore, which looks to focus more on the occult rather than, say, Miss Marple. Which alone is an interesting detail, considering she is the biggest skeptic of the group. But owning a bookstore that focuses on the occult means not only are we highlighting her being bookish, but that she has a genuine interest in these topics, even if she doesn't believe in most of them. In the live action movies, Velma is upset that Fred was always the one given credit for solving mysteries when she was the one doing all the heavy lifting. But despite her being unhappy about this fact, her character is still presented as the bookish girl. Only now, the nerd angle was leaned into a little harder, which, considering the overall tone James Gunn was going for, is alright for a silly live-action film and its sequel. Although in the sequel we got, like, hot Velma? 
It was very weird and clearly someone's poorly disguised fetish, which I'm not even criticizing. If you want to portray the nerdy Velma as one of the Charlie's angels, more power to you. But it seems it's after this where the writers seemed unsure how to actually write Velma. Sometimes she's a nerd stereotype except a girl. Sometimes she's perpetually annoyed at everyone else in the group and seems like she doesn't even want to be there. Sometimes she's barely a character. Sometimes she's used to subvert expectations that, whoa, it was the nerdy Velma who was the freaky one. Should have known Velma was good to go. It's always the quiet ones. Personally, I think Velma shouldn't be that hard to write. I just think that the show writers who don't know how to handle her need to make more friends with girls who write character analysis essays about the Silmarillion. It seems clear in some shows, the writers have never had interactions with smart girls unless the smart girl was extremely standoffish and insistent on her own intelligence. Either that, or they write all intelligent characters as standoffish and pedantic like this because that's how they view intelligent guys and then they just gender bend that kind of writing. It sounds weird, but I think the best version of modern Velma was the one Cartoon Network bumper where Johnny Bravo is upset because he and Velma were in a very serious relationship, but when he proposed to her, she was heartbroken to tell him her career came first. Also, Jello Apocalypse said that Velma being a skeptic makes her a terrible scientist or investigator. But I think I also disagree with him, at least so far as to how it makes her character behave within the group. Mysteries Inc. have, at one end of the spectrum, Shaggy and Scooby. The two cowards who are afraid of absolutely everything and are fully convinced ghosts are real. And on the opposite side of the spectrum you have Velma, who doesn't seem scared of anything and doesn't believe in ghosts at all. That's a perfect setup for Mysteries Inc. Hell, it's the perfect setup for most ghost shows. I already Very saw fun. people getting pissed at me in last week's debrief and they were like, well, if this is all he's gonna do every week, but what do you want from me? I have to be here for the half of the audience that doesn't buy into this. They need me, man. And we're tired of trying to explain this shit to you people. <laughs> don't care. <laughs> so how does this relate to the Velma in, well, Velma? The thing is, it doesn't. Like I said, Mindy has gone on record saying she wanted the character of Velma to essentially be her self-insert and honestly I'm not gonna touch that because there is nothing I could respond to that with which isn't like really insulting. But even ignoring Mindy's self-insert, this character isn't Velma. Do you know who this character is? It's Meg. This character is if you took Meg from Family Guy and made her the main character. I'm not the first person to make this observation, but it really is true. Not that any of the characters in Family Guy have any solid foundation, since they completely change every episode depending on what the writers want to soapbox that week, but Meg is mostly portrayed in modern Family Guy as just being insufferable. She's self-righteous, she's annoying, most of her dialogue consists of her complaining about something, and also Family Guy does its best to insult her looks at every opportunity, making her out to be extremely unattractive even though she doesn't really look any worse than anyone else. That's Velma. That's literally Velma's entire character. So if you ever watched Family Guy and thought to yourself, man, I wish we could have every episode have Meg as the main character, here you go, I guess. Although I know Meg does have a certain kind of fan base, so I don't know, maybe there are people out there who are super into this version of Velma. There are some stands out there who will back the most insufferable characters in a completely unironic, diehard way. I just had like a femdom blog come after me last week because I dared to call Ashley Williams a racist. I can't tell the aliens from the animals. We start off episode 7 with Velma declaring her hallucinations are finally cured for real this time no seriously. And she can as a result focus on finding her mom, who was taken by the serial killer. Velma has made the jump in logic that her mom, who left behind this handwritten note, disappeared because she came face to face with the serial killer. But like, it's a serial killer. It's in the name. 
So why Velma believes her mom was, quote, taken by the serial killer makes absolutely no sense to me. The very logical conclusion that her mother was killed by the serial killer is not even considered because that being the most obvious possibility renders the entire mystery of what happened to her pointless. The show wrote itself into a corner, needing Velma to not give up on finding her mom and to keep the mystery of what happened to Velma's mom alive for there to be a story. And so the most obvious conclusion of her mom being dead is not mentioned because it's inconvenient to the plot they want to have. Instead of looking for more information about Edna Pardue, who seems the most likely suspect of being the serial killer, Velma instead wastes her time trying to figure out what jinkies means by doing things like reading all of her mom's mystery novel manuscripts and insulting them in the process. Luckily, she doesn't waste my time because this was all done via montage, while completely ignoring Daphne's various messages and phone calls until Daphne has to physically show up at her house and demand to talk to her. I have lost count how many times Daphne has tried to talk to Velma by this point. Velma blows her off as usual and comes home to find Sophie in a pile of blood, but it's just a fake out. There's something called Fog Fest coming up and apparently people ask each other out if they want to go to the festival together through what I can best describe as YouTube pranks without the YouTube. You know, like a promposal, but for Fogfest. Velma wants to know why the hell Fogfest is still happening when there's a serial killer loose, which is a very good point. And her dad lets her know that curfew has been cancelled because now everyone believes the serial killer is actually the ghost of Edna Pardue, after Norville's mother went to the press for... some reason. I am actually fine with this, as this is one of the very few elements of Scooby-Doo that connects back to the original show, where entire theme parks and mansions would be shut down due to a Phantom of the Opera style haunting. Sophie adds that Velma isn't the only one still concerned, however, and all girls who attend Fogfest have to have a date. Girls have to have a date? Great, so Fogfest is not only dangerous, it's sexist too. Velma? Velma. Velma. The serial killer, the one that is actively on the hunt, targets girls. Oh my god, she's a terrible detective. Not even detective, she's just terrible at basic level logic. So here's a fun fact. In the 70s, when the son of Sam was on his killing spree in New York City, he had, by pure coincidence, killed several women in a row who all happened to be brunettes with long hair. Now, this didn't actually mean anything because the son of Sam targeted people based on where he could find parking in New York, not a joke, but the NYPD made a note of this accidental pattern and, because by this point they were starting to figure out that serial killers had preferred victims, announced that girls with brown hair not go out until he was captured. This also resulted in an uptick in women dyeing their hair blonde and cutting it short. Many young brown-haired women in Queens are worried about their safety because of the 44 caliber killer. Now, as I said, this was actually purely coincidence in this one case, but this concept that police would focus in on a serial killer's pattern is a real thing. But Velma thinks following a logical path of thinking is sexist. Okay. Anyway, even the police are happy to announce the curfew is over because if the serial killer is a ghost, then it means they are not incompetent, because how are they supposed to arrest a ghost? So everyone in town is ready to party and just get on with their lives after being locked indoors for so long, in what I'm sure was the writers trying to indirectly channel the 2020 lockdown in what would be a valid form of drawing from personal experience to build believable fiction, if not for the fact that we have never actually seen any of the characters have to deal with being locked in their homes for curfew, because it was only a thing in one episode, and in that episode, the main characters broke curfew anyway, and all the parents of the main cast weren't home. Meanwhile, Fred is practicing his Fog King acceptance speech, and he gives the stock response that he could never have made it this far without his Fog Queen, Velma. <laughs> is that a joke, Fred, or are you being serious? Or is it that cable comedy thing where it's both? This line of dialogue really annoys me because it's just dripping with smugness while also being incorrect. The cable comedy thing where it's both is not actually a thing. It's a thing this show is doing, this show being Velma, and as the entire internet's reaction might have clued you in, 
doesn't really work. And it portrays what the show's writers think writing for an adult comedy audience is. Which you'd think they'd know how to do better considering both Mindy Kaling and Charlie Grandy both worked on The Office. But I personally never watched The Office so I have no idea if this is how that show writes its humour too. I have to imagine it's at least better executed because The Office is generally considered to be one of the best comedy shows ever written, while Velma is Velma. But in my experience, when a show writes something which is both comedy and serious at the same time, it usually knows how to balance the comedy and serious tone so the audience isn't left emotionally confused and frustrated. Okay, side quest time. So, on one end of the spectrum you have comedy. And on the other end, you have seriousness. These two things are, at least tonally, opposites to each other. Kung Pao isn't serious and Solaris isn't funny. Now, serious can be funny when it's done badly, but when the seriousness is done badly, it's not serious and funny at the same time, it's just funny, albeit unintentionally, because the seriousness failed. Most successful movies, whether you want to count that as financially successful or successful in its narrative, depends on the film, but most successful movies have a very delicate balance of both. Casablanca is rightfully heralded as one of the greatest movies ever made, and you should watch it. A story of a romance between three people right in the middle of the Second World War, filmed while the real war was still ongoing and the Allies' victory being anything of a certainty dealing with personal betrayal, political betrayal, lost love, bitterness, and making the difficult choice to do the right thing for the greater good, even if the personal cost is a high one, and doing the right thing both on a personal level as well as a worldwide level. That is a serious tone. But despite it being a relatively serious movie dealing with serious topics released during a serious time, Casablanca also knows how to be funny. Close me up on what ground? I'm shocked, shocked to find that gambling is going on in here. <laughs> You're winning, sir. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> but the humor is precise, carefully crafted, and delivered where it's appropriate, either to lower the tension so it can be built back up again in later scenes, or to add that sense of madness to a situation in a world where very little seems to make sense anymore. It's funny when the police chief pockets his gambling winnings when he's shutting down the bar for gambling. It's not funny when the French refugees start singing La Marseillaise to drown out the Nazi officers singing De Wacht am Rhein. With most of the extras in the scene played by real French refugees who had fled Europe due to the very war this film is set in. The crying you see in the film is real. Similarly, the two Guardians of the Galaxies movies are funny. Their genre can only really classify as blockbuster superhero movie, which can vary wildly in tone depending on the film, but the Guardians films tend to be a lot heavier on the comedy than, say, Batman. A lot of time, Guardians' humor comes from its misfit cast behaving irreverently and chaotically to the situations they find themselves in, accompanied by witty dialogue and well-written personalities bouncing off each other. In some way, it has relatively similar humor as you'd find in cable comedy, with the characters' jokes being rooted in some form of irony or self-deprecation or pop culture reference. Of course, the difference is that not only are the jokes funny, but they also directly tie into each character and that character's complex personality, psyche, and experiences. Meaning even the ironic humor is placed with purpose and intent, rather than just self-aware irony for its own sake. But Guardians of the Galaxy has some of the hardest hitting serious moments in the MCU. Even if the serious scenes hold small moments of dialogue and one-liners which may be funny removed from context, within the scene they come from, all they really do is humanize the serious tone and thereby enhancing it. They're not trying to be both, because the Guardians films at no point think anyone is going to laugh at Quilt saying David Hasselhoff has the voice of an angel when he's saying it in the middle of a eulogy. It's not funny. The joke being here just makes the sadness all the more sad, because we already know joking around and not being serious is Quill's defense against emotional honesty. This joke is here because this is who the character is, not because we're supposed to find it funny. It's not just a sad scene because someone is sad, it's a sad scene because Quill is the person who is sad. 
A very simple but effective use of comedy is to have a scene that is set up to be serious and then after a build up, undercut it with a joke. This, however, makes the scene not be serious anymore because the serious tone was only there for a setup for the punchline. So that's not doing both at the same time, that's just telling a joke. A much more rarely used and frankly more interesting trick, which I've only really seen done by Kung Fu Panda, is to have the joke come first and then undercut the joke with a sincere one-liner. Which, just like it does with a punchline, makes the serious one-liner hit harder because we know that the joke leading up to it was funny, but it was in service of something true and honest. I mean, you could call this doing both at the same time, but obviously this is not what Velma is talking about. The writers of the show think that being funny and serious at the same time is to set up a serious topic and then undercut it with a punchline. However, their idea of a punchline is to simply make a reference to something topical. Not even political, just topical. Something irreverent, which makes it clear that the show has no sense of value in anything as some kind of postmodernist nightmare. But the punchline isn't funny, and it's made the lead up to the punchline pointless because the serious lead up was only there in service of the unfunny punchline. And yet, the show does this for every serious topic and every serious conversation and every serious scene, which means that none of the scenes are serious because they're all in service of unfunny jokes. So we, the audience, get the message that none of the show's plot, characters, situation, setting, dialogue or anything should be worth emotionally investing in. There is no point in the show where the serious situation is left to be serious. And every single punchline it delivers to every single serious lead-up is also unfunny, relying on simple topical observations and references as well as lip service to US politics and snide, bitter, seething criticisms and hatred for most general talking points in an attempt to come across as disaffective and above the things it's mocking because it wants you to see it as cool, aloof and intelligent. And if there's one thing that pseudo-intellectuals love to use to make them seem like they're smarter than they are is to try and come across as if only dull-witted commoners succumb to emotions and that they are unmoved by whatever are the most common talking points of life and pop culture at the time. He's worse than the free therapy app I downloaded that's obviously Russian spyware. Oh, это Вельма. Интересно, она гей? I swore you to secrecy. You placed your hand on your verified check mark and everything. You look like a white influencer trying to choreograph her own dance instead of just stealing one. Still, if I can separate reality dating shows exploitation of women from my obsessive need to watch them, I can separate Gigi from Norville. It's historical society. Places like this help Skip Gates learn which white actors are descended from slave owners. Okay, so don't search for daddy issues and teenage girls and a bookmark. Not to get overly academic in this Scooby-Doo spin-off cartoon Velma review, but I keep thinking about this one thing David Foster Wallace had to say about postmodernism in television writing. The, the problem though is now is that a lot of the shticks of postmodernism, irony, cynicism, irreverence, are now part of whatever it is that's enervating in the culture itself. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm a fan of postmodernism in many ways because there is a small part of me that's a bit of a troll and that sometimes I take a lot of delight in the slaughtering of sacred cows. Holy crap! A ballad already? And such a bold departure from the original source material! But anyway, David Foster Wallace once said this about this style of writing. Irony has no redemptive qualities in and of itself. It can point out problems and deconstruct things, but it offers no solution. It's like a rebel dethroning a tyrant, only to become a better tyrant. I'm putting the link to Will Schroeder's video in the card up here. It's a little less than 10 minutes long, and I highly recommend you watch it, because although it came out before Velma was ever even announced, it accurately breaks down everything wrong with Velma's writing. Hilariously, Shoulder in the video actually points at The Office as a show which manages to circumvent the style of writing by having genuine sincerity and emotional honesty to it, and he says this as Mindy Kaling briefly appears on screen. Indeed, rarely does the show use irony at the expense of a character ever. But to get back on track, with this line of 
is this like cable television which does serious and comedy at the same time? Velma is not only trying to be ironic, but it's trying to be ironic about the way ironic shows are written, while also being an ironically written show. It's both criticizing the style of writing, while at the exact same time, within the same line of dialogue, being the thing it's criticizing. We have reached the point of meta-aware comedy writing where meta-aware comedies have to lampshade the fact that their humor is meta in an attempt to shield itself from criticism of criticizing things too much. It's being meta about being meta with the goal of criticizing itself first before its audience can criticize it for being too meta. Velma is operating on such a 4D level of chess in terms of trying to outrun its own audience's criticisms, it's inventing brand new ways to fail. Because despite this nightmare Mobius strip of cynicism, Velma is being smug about being meta, about being serious and funny at the same time, while failing to be either funny or serious. So not only is it being insufferable, it's being insufferable while being completely unaware that it's fucking up the very thing it's smug about. Or, in other words... I'm bleeding. Making me the victor. Fred points out that they have a girl murdering serial killer ghost in their basement, so who cares if he's attracted to a nerd? By the way, I know all these characters have names, but if you've been here for a while, you know that I suck at names unless they're a Mass Effect or Yusagi or Jimbo characters. And frankly, do you really care what Fred's mom's name is other than Fred's mom? Anyway, Fred's mom tells him that they don't sell accessories, they sell perfection. And so Fred, as the future head of a company, needs to sell that perfection by being Fog King, and that he can't win the title if he associates with Velma. Sarah, her father said, life is a prom, I know you won't disappoint me and mom. If that's the case, why did Fred's dad have a problem with him being attracted to Velma in the previous episode where Fogfest didn't exist yet apart from a poster in Velma's bedroom? If you want this to be your reasoning, you need to actually establish it. Especially as up until now, Fred's dad didn't seem to have any reason for why he didn't want Fred to be attracted to Velma and just assumed the audience would decide it's because Fred's family is white and rich. This is so sloppy. Back at the school, Gigi is upset because Norville hasn't asked her to Fogfest. Olive, who I kept calling Olivia before, points out Norville is a bad boyfriend because he let Gigi almost die from a bee sting, and also his grandmother is a ghost who is on a serial killing spree and Gigi is a prime target. Velma butts in to tell them it's not a ghost, only for Norville to jump out of Gigi's locker dressed as a ghost to ask her to Fogfest. But that's what I love about you. Oh, who am I kidding? Of course I'll go to Fogfest with you. How is Gigi the most likable and endearing character in this show and she's not even part of Mysteries Inc? Whose OC is this? I mean, everyone else is so horrible, I'm not even complaining. I'm just curious as to who snuck their OC into this show because she's clearly too good for it. Velma is upset that Norville is going to Fogfest because she's made the logic jump that it means he also believes the serial killer is a ghost. The mental gymnastics in this episode are really on another level. Also, we get another funny joke, which I'm going to credit Norville's voice actor for. Norville, oh you're God. going to- Oh, by the way, Velma also mentions she used to be a flat earther. What a good detective who operates on the basis of evidence and logic. God, I hate this writing. Norville says he doesn't believe in the ghost, but he really hurt Gigi's feelings and he knows she was looking forward to going. He also points out he thinks Velma needs to go to Fogfest because she's always enjoyed it and he thinks she needs to calm down a little. Interesting that now Norville has apparently cured his attraction to Velma, he's morphed into a completely different character who is actually thoughtful and emotionally mature. This is either credit to Gigi's good influence or further damnation of how Velma makes everyone around her worse. You decide. Velma says she wants to go, but she needs a date, and with Norville taken, she has no fallback because nobody else can stand being around her. So now that she needs something from her, she goes to talk to Daphne. Ah! Oh god, it's another ghost! The ghost of Velma! Someone make it disappear by trying to talk to it! She's entirely valid with this, by the way. 
Anyway, Fred shows up to have another good joke. What? Ow! What the hell, Fred? Go to Fogfest with me, please. Daphne points out that Fred is supposed to scare her, not hurt her, and Velma has a truly flabbergastingly bad line where she says Fred is actually asking her out by scaring her into thinking Fred is back into shallow girls. Wow. Fred tells her, unfortunately, he really is asking Daphne because he needs to be Fog King. Daphne says yes, and they walk off together, leaving Velma to stutter and look like an idiot. They immediately catch the entire school's attention that the power couple is back together. You know, we never actually saw them officially break up at any point. I can't tell whether that's something I'd like to see or not though, because it would just be more insufferable teen drama that goes nowhere. Oh well. That evening, Velma Sulk saying how she's gonna focus on catching the serial killer while everyone else is wasting their time at Fogfest, as she has to watch her family, crush, and friends all go without her. I see you ignoring me! <sighs> yeah, what's that like? Wait, and now you're drinking? That's uncharacteristic! Why is that uncharacteristic? Daphne told us her character is based on high-risk behavior. Granted, we've seen nothing of that supposed character trait up until this moment, Actually, what is Daphne's character in this show? For being one of the more important main characters, I never feel like I fully understand what Daphne's personality is supposed to be. She's a stereotypical popular girl at the high school, although the only reason I can see why this is, is the fact that she's attractive. And although that's most of the war already won, usually the stereotypical lead cheerleader type of girl has more than just her looks to give her some kind of identity. Hot bot, hot boy, to your captain, plus she was rich. Oh yeah. Even in the world of broad high school stereotypes of the teen drama, the hot girl needs more to her to warrant her popularity than just being hot. Especially in Daphne's case, where she is one of a collection of hot girls. What makes Daphne the hot girl that all the other hot girls orbit around? Especially when we have characters like Olive, who is extremely self-confident and self-assured in both her looks as well as her opinions. None of the other hot girls really have any solid personality at all and just fade into the background, but that can't be the justification for why Daphne is the de facto leader. In Mean Girls, the reason Regina is the head girl is because she is not only the most vindictive and manipulative, ruling with an iron fist as it were, but her parents are also insanely rich. Meaning if you can get into her good books, there are all kinds of financial benefits. Regina's true claim to the throne of Queen Bee, however, is her ability to use her sex appeal and wealth as weapons to manipulate others and turn their own insecurities against them. Regina isn't where she is in the social ladder just because she's very pretty, she's where she is due to strategy and mind games. In Revolutionary Girl Utina, the leader of the Mean Girl Squad, Nanami, who is one of my favorite characters, is the head mean girl not through her own power, but through her association with her older brother, the president of the student council, the most sought after boy on the whole school, and the resident man whore who is more than happy to use his position as prime real estate to travel from one girl's bed to another, with every girl both being fully aware that he won't be interested in anything more than casual sex, but secretly hoping that they might be the one girl who can keep him. And, as his little sister, Nanami is fully aware that her own value is only measured by her association with her brother, which is a horrible position to be in and makes Nanami's self-worth eggshell fragile. She is fully aware that her gaggle of hanger-on mean girls are only there because they hope to get closer to her brother via their alliance with her, while Nanami also struggles with conflicting feelings of adoration for her brother, which she has confused for romantic feelings because she has unfairly been placed in the position by her brother into one of emotional codependence, where she is unsure where her sense of self starts and her adoration for her brother ends and whether those emotions are adoration, romantic, or desperation for any sense of value. Being the head cheerleader popular girl in a teen high school story is not about being attractive. It's about power. 
your family is rich, which automatically gives other girls a reason to try and seek your approval because it gives them access to a rich person's lifestyle by proxy. Your brother is highly sought after, so girls are willing to act as your lackeys in the thin hope that being in your good books might get them closer to him. You're the head of the cheerleader squad, which automatically associates with the school's athletic team of physically fit and attractive dudes. Meaning, anyone who wants to be accepted into the highly sought after position of cheerleader has to appeal to you personally to be allowed into the group. And of course, being in the good graces of the meanest girls in school offers some kind of protection from that very same mean girl group's bullying. High school mean girls are the mob, is basically what I'm saying. Daphne has nothing to wield as power over the other girls and cannot offer them anything in exchange for elevating her to the position of queen of high school land. She's just attractive. You could argue that her dating the extremely rich and conventionally attractive Fred might give her some power, but when they were presumably broken up, none of the other girls seemed to even give Fred a passing thought or place any importance on him whatsoever. And for that matter, Daphne seems to slip in and out of being the head hot girl into being completely separate from the other popular girls. One minute, she's leading her group of lackeys to bully Velma into staying away from Fred. The next, she's selling drugs in a single episode and then never again to try and make money. Then she's violently against the idea of being emotionally vulnerable to the point where she's literally beating up the other hot girls into a pulp. Then she's locked up in her room while the serial killer is loose just so she doesn't have to take part in the hot girl makeover. Then she supposedly has a high risk personality type who thrives on danger. And now she's back to being the queen of high school by dating Fred. And for some reason she's drinking which is out of character for her. The only consistent personality trait she has displayed at all is she's desperate to talk to Velma and keeps getting ignored. This character is nobody. She's the bare bones concept of a popular girl with none of the meat or marrow. She's an empty shell with the label of a trope written on her forehead and the writers assumed this was enough for the audience to fill in the blanks themselves. While grumbling to herself about Daphne ignoring her, Velma swats a spider with one of her mom's manuscripts, which somehow makes her realize that there might be invisible ink involved with the Jinkies note. Velma, the incredible detective, was almost thwarted by a 1950s gag product. Anyway, there's a phone number on the note which connects her to an unknown caller who doesn't say anything, but Velma actually uses something resembling detective work by figuring out from the noises in the background that whoever the person on the phone was is at Fogfest. Oh wait, I'm sorry, not just the other person on the phone. Velma just decides the person on the other end of the line is the serial killer because of reasons. Because she doesn't have a date and as such wouldn't be allowed in, Velma disguises herself as a man. She wanders around this amusement park, Piercing, where Fogface is being held, looking for the serial killer. Yeah, the show is just like, yeah, she's right, it's the serial killer, don't worry about it. She calls the phone number again while on the, um, the drop machine thing, and after spotting him, waits for the drop so she can go after him but Norville paid the ride operator to hold it at the top so he can formally apologize to Gigi for ignoring her calls when she needed him and asks her to be his fog queen. I would say this is very nice of him and shows him to be a great person, but I still remember the previous six episodes. Also, I just want to take a second to say I love Gigi's outfit. It's gorgeous. Fred is bribing the children to vote for him and Daphne to be Fog King and Queen, and is outraged to find out Norval and Gigi are also running for it. Daphne is still drinking and gets distracted by Velma falling off the ride into some trash and unfortunately not breaking her neck in the process. Daphne doesn't recognize her, but is instantly attracted to her and you all saw this coming. Anyway, Velma eating like a caveman impresses Olive and whoever the nearest hot girl hanger on is, but Velma runs away before they can, um, flirt with him more, I guess. Velma then goes to the bathroom and comments about how much easier it is to be a dude using the men's room. Daphne, who is pretty trashed by now, drags her into the fog and asks her if she wants to dance. She then compliments Velma's half-hearted dancing, saying how it's cute when men do that. 
At the tent where the dance is being held, Fred confronts Norville about him also running for Fog King. The DJ intervenes and says that instead of them settling this with a dance-off, they should just fight. It's like a dance-off, but with this. During this fight, when Shiki tries to tell Norville she doesn't care about being Fog Queen that much, he basically lets drop that Gigi really wants to be Fog Queen and she's just saying that because she's been blown off by Velma's voice messages so often and she's emotionally damaged from Velma always ignoring her before correcting himself. Proving that I was right not to give this character any credit earlier. Meanwhile... Velma realizes that as a guy, all her worst qualities as a girl are the things people like about her. I'm pretty sure Velma's personality would be just as insufferable and annoying regardless of her gender, but that's just me. Velma climbs up on stage and announces that ghosts aren't real, the curfew should be reinstated, and that the serial killer is still on the loose. And because she's pretending to be a man, everyone now believes her. I could argue the reason they wouldn't believe her before is not because she was a girl, but because she was wretched, constantly making everything about her and her mom, always doing her best to be unlikable and confrontational, a flat earther, and constantly having psychiatric episodes where she sees things that aren't real. Whereas nobody has any reason to distrust this man making this announcement because they don't know him. Also, Velma has decided she scared the serial killer off for tonight, for reasons I don't know. Daphne says they should make Velma Fog King, or Manny as she's calling herself, and everyone agrees. No wonder men are so desperate to hold onto their power. This is the easiest shit ever. As a guy, I can do anything. <laughs> Fred's parents kick him out of the house because he failed to get the prom king crown. Daphne wants to make out with Velma, but the show writers have enough self-awareness not to make their main character take advantage of their crush. Velma says they should calm down before anything serious happens. Too bad Mindy doesn't display the same level of restraint regarding sexual harassment in real life. And that looked around and I improvised just kissing him in the scene, which was not in the script. It's not in the scene. You just... Velma, for the first time, asks Daphne if she's okay when she realizes just how drunk Daphne is, and she admits that she's not doing so great. She tells Manny everything she's been going through the past few episodes. Okay, well, a uh, missing mom is pretty big. My criminal parents also abandoned me. Oh, that's awful. I'm sorry, but is that bigger than... No, no, you're right. A good friend would have been there for you even if your thing wasn't worse than her thing. I am always surprised by this show when it has these truly hateful horrible characters and then in scenes like this shows that it is aware that the characters are horrible. But then because Velma is Mindy's self-insert, whenever the writing or narrative risks calling her out on her own horrible actions, you can feel Mindy as the producer grab and yank the reins to go back on track so Velma is never put in a position where she actually needs to change her bad behavior. She just needs to go, wow, that was really shitty of me, and then do absolutely nothing to change anything because simply acknowledging how awful she is is the same thing as being a better person. This feels like the later seasons of Charmed after Alyssa Milano and Holly Marie Combs became producers which led to their characters on screen both becoming horrendously worse people while also always being in the right and never having to answer for terrible things they do. If we die, it's your fault! My fault? Nothing is ever my fault! Uh. Anyway, Daphne feels closer to this many person that she's ever felt to Velma, possibly because at this moment Velma in disguise has actually listened to her emotional troubles and been there for her. And Velma is suddenly perfectly okay with kissing a drunk Daphne under false pretenses until Fred shows up and rips her mustache off, having figured out she's Velma because he'd fantasized about Velma touching his face for weeks and so recognized her when she accidentally slapped him earlier. Once again, proving that Fred is consistently written as a far better detective than Velma has been. We should keep a list of all the actual detective work Fred has not only done, but done successfully. 
Stephanie storms off, saying she wants to punch Velma, but men sexualize women fighting, and Velma jokingly does the baby you're acting hysterical thing. Hip cynical transcendence of sentiment is really some kind of fear of being really human. Anyway, they're about to crown Manny Fog King until Fred jumps on stage and announces that Manny was just Velma in disguise, so he can be made Fog King. But it's given to Norval instead after he pushed a child off a pier so he could rescue her. He tries to call Gigi to the stage to be his queen, but she's left the festival without him. Velma, meanwhile, has gone to search for Daphne and finds her hiding under the pier. Daphne, I'm sorry. I wanted to tell you I was Manny, but as a guy, there's so little consequence for your actions. I was like, I'd be an idiot not to at least try and go for it. And they were like, hey man, what are you doing? You could be sued for that. And I got very scared, uh, and then I said, um, tell anyone and you're fired. <laughs> so, I said, tell anyone and you're fired. The way it's done. Daphne says she's not even mad at Velma. She's mad at herself for giving Velma a chance to hurt her in a completely new way. Velma says she's mad at herself for always using people to find her mom. She then says that she feels guilty if she does anything else other than looking for her mom. Cool story, bro, but your personal trauma doesn't justify your decisions and actions to hurt other people, which is something you actively have control over. Oh, boo-hoo-hoo, -hoo. my wife and child are dead. Everybody's got dead people. It's no excuse to get everybody else dead along the way. Trauma isn't your fault, but it's your responsibility not to let it steer you towards harming others. You can't just hurt and traumatize other people, and when you get called out, your defense is, but my mentals. Anyway, they're interrupted by the serial killer, but manage to get away after Daphne roundhouse kicks him in the face. Norval is looking for Gigi and is ambushed by Fred stealing his crown and they start running around in the fog and the show has the absolute audacity to play the Scooby-Doo chase music as if it's done anything at all to give it the right to invoke the original source material. The original source material isn't even that sacred. This show is just so awful that any direct reference to the original Scooby-Doo feels like a grave insult. Oh, I hate this part with the doors. Of course, they had to bring this entire chase scene to a grinding halt to point out that the Doors joke is not physically possible, because if this show doesn't make a meta-aware joke every 15 seconds, it will die. The serial killer disappears in the fog, and Fred's crown gets comedically swapped for the serial killer's phone, so Velma can't call him to find out where he is. The show tries to paint Fred as an asshole for being more concerned with his missing crown than tracking down the serial killer, but Fred mentions that if he doesn't come home with the crown, his parents are literally going to lock him out of the house and he's gonna have to sleep in his car. I would like to remind everyone that Fred is canonically 15 years old in this show. Gigi calls Norval out for ignoring her the entire night just so he could make himself Fog King to get back at Velma for ignoring him the whole time. God, I feel stupid writing some of these sentences. Norval comments he's a monster, and this is enough for Gigi to forgive him. Fred digs the crown out of the trash so he can avoid being mentally abused by his parents for the night. Daphne and Velma walk out of the festival together, and Velma promises her that once she actually manages to find her mom, she's totally for real going to pay attention to what Daphne is going through. And then Fred gets grabbed by the serial killer, and the episode ends. Maybe it's just because I'm coming back to this show after a short break, but this episode genuinely infuriated me, but in a way where I can't point to anything specific that was worse than any previous episode. So I might just chalk this up to me forgetting how bad this whole thing is. Daphne's lack of a solid personality is becoming more obvious now that her mini arc is over. One thing she keeps mentioning that I haven't brought up too much is the fact that Daphne has severe abandonment issues due to her parents. She had abandonment issues before meeting them, but learning they purposefully left her behind as a baby messed her up. Not to mention them abandoning her a second time without even hesitating. But the problem is, she doesn't showcase any of the personality traits associated with having abandonment issues. She just mentions how her issues makes her extra super sad when Velma ignores her. And I guess she decided to get drunk this episode for a while there, but it didn't amount to anything. If her abandonment issues really affected her, 
She would be clingy, she would demand a lot of attention, she would have severe anxiety issues in general, she would also be resistant to forming any strong bonds with other people and actively do horrible things to push them away. You know, like Velma. Hell, you could even take the one unique character trait she says she has of a high-risk addiction and make it so that the reason she does this is not the adrenaline, but because she's desperate to gain other people's sympathy to reaffirm their love for her because her abandonment issues would make her need constant reassurance. But Daphne doesn't display any of this. She says she has a high-risk personality without showing it, and she says she has abandonment issues without showing any behavior of it. All this while also being head popular girl without ever showing any reason for it. Daphne, much like Fred, has never had the strongest personality in the original show. You can say it's because she was the attractive girl all you want, but original Daphne and Fred were pretty much in equal measures of nothingness. However, whereas Fred has had a very slow buildup of personality slowly being added to him over decades, Daphne has the unique problem of being an attractive female character. This means she constantly has to get rewritten to match whatever the current view of writing female characters is. In the 90s, the big joke was that Daphne was a girly girl who stressed about breaking nails and getting her hair messed up. In the live-action Scooby-Doo movie, we got the Spice Girls Catwoman style of feminist writing where she has to prove to everyone that she's not just a damsel in distress who needs rescuing the whole time, but that she is, in fact, a strong, independent woman. Thankfully, even in the early 2000s, James Gunn was good at writing character tropes, but instilled them with a sincerity that made them more human. As Daphne played the role of emotional support and best friend to Velma, which you'd think would be a given, but apparently we didn't really think about Velma and Daphne's friendship before this. Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island before this had less of the damsel in distress inversion thing going on, but all they really did was make Daphne a successful and respected talk show host. She kind of reminds me of what Barbie's personality in the 80s and 90s was, which is to say, not much. But then after the 2000s, Daphne was turned into, well, nothing really. She has a crush on Fred most of the time, although this kind of just came from general assumptions that the two attractive characters would end up together, without any big fanfares that Daphne and Fred are officially a couple from Hanna-Barbera or anything. I'm actually not mad at this because despite it being a two attractive characters standing next to each other so they must be in love thing, I do think that in the better written Scooby-Doo shows and movies, they can work off each other very well. Or rather, Fred is an absolute delight of a character and he needs Daphne to be there as the straight man. Daphne's characteristics boil down to being danger prone and getting into accidents a lot, coming from a rich family and being eye candy. Without anything to really work with, I'm not annoyed that Velma decided to basically invent a brand new character to represent Daphne, but I am annoyed that the personality they had to make up for her is never shown to us on screen and is instead explained to us. As a result, despite all this weird backstory and complicated relationships with her and Velma and her and Fred, Daphne is still a substanceless character with nothing interesting to say about her other than what her character design looks like and that she and Velma are a semi-couple in this show. She's less than a plot device since none of the motions she goes through even aids the plot. She is, at best, a foible for Velma to wrestle with. But with nothing ever developing beyond petty high school bullshit fighting and whatever serious moments they do have together being completely kneecapped by pop culture references and badly placed topical one-liners. Daphne is possibly the most hollow character in the entire cast, and that includes Gigi, who I don't even really know why she's in this show. The next episode starts with Velma showing us that her mom's disappearance actually has nothing to do with why she's so awful, because even when her mom was around, she would do things like drag Daphne away from her own birthday party so she can spend time with Velma instead. Back at the Fog Fest, Fred's mom asks Velma to help her find Fred who is missing, but Velma blows her off to drag Daphne away from talking to her friends. I'm really glad we're finally friends again. Same. Oh my god, I'm so mad we're friends again! 
Oh no. So, this episode has a fun new little way to torture me. To have this entire episode be out of chronological order and jump back and forth between where we last left off and some point in the future where Daphne and Velma are trapped in a ravine in the woods under a boulder. Because this show wasn't content with just making its audience angry at it, it actively hates you and wants you to hurt. Anyway, back at the end of Fogfest, Daphne's moms are driving them home. Velma is trying to figure out the password on the phone, which... Do Americans have like passwords on their phones that are words? Isn't it just a pin code or do you guys do things differently in the states? Anyway, it doesn't matter because Daphne is too busy liking Olive's messages and Velma gets mad at her for not being completely focused on Velma while she's trying to find her mom. Velma asks Daphne's moms for help because they're cops, but they say they have no proof the phone belongs to the serial killer, so that would be illegal, which I'm pretty sure that's wrong, but I don't know enough to say that as a solid fact. Daphne's moms say that Daphne is great at hacking open phones after dot 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 the incident which is a brand new plot point the show has introduced now that Daphne no longer has a personality since the plot about her real parents is over with oh yeah I forgot to mention that entire subplot is done we never go back to it again so I hope you all enjoyed Daphne's deep complex backstory that was essential to the narrative anyway Daphne doesn't want Velma to know what the incident was You're saying if this was a flashback in your point of view, in order for it to be earned, we'd have to cut to, I don't know, Fred? I like it when they use a title card with the character's name when they cut to a different flashback. Now that feels lazy. It's stylized. It's Tarantino. What is the incident? what I was remembering. We cut to Fred locked in an underground lab where he runs into the three hot girls' brains floating in jars and bickering with each other. But enough of that, we cut back to Velma and Daphne. Daphne has a black light and points out they can use it to see which numbers the serial killer pressed on the phone. I wonder how well this would work considering Velma has been grabbing and poking it all night without wearing gloves, but whatever. Velma has suddenly decided that finding the serial killer, and by extension her mother, is for the first time not her main focus, and she wants to know what the incident was involving Daphne. This is because, despite Velma's entire character revolving around finding her mother, the show has no intention to write characters as actual people, and is only interested in shuffling them around like pawns on a chessboard to make happen whatever they need to for the sake of the plot or bad jokes. Daphne admits she had a crush on someone and it made her hack into their phone to see if they liked her and they didn't and that's all there is to it. But Velma wants to know who it was and Daphne has to yell at her to focus on finding her mother. They open the phone, which I would point out just using someone's password is not hacking, but people use that word when someone gets into their Twitter accounts because they made their password their birth date, so whatever. The phone only has one thing of note on it, which is a photo of a mountain in the woods, which is a tourist attraction or something. Velma says they'll go there tomorrow. Daphne will give her the details on the incident in the car ride. Daphne gets another photo from Olive, which she hits like on, and Velma is already hounding her about, who are you texting the whole time? Meanwhile, the brains tell Fred that they don't know who did this to them, but whoever it is plans to put them in someone else's body. I'm confused how they would know the serial killer's plan, but not have any idea as to who the serial killer even is, but I also don't care enough to get annoyed about it. Fred says that Velma was wrong, and this is the ghost of Edna Pardue come back to finish her work. The brains are shocked to hear Fred has been hanging out with Velma, and he denies it to save face. Phew, you going from Daphne to Velma is worse than going from a beloved cartoon to a playful reimagining. No, a pup named Scooby-Doo is a playful reimagining. This is a self-congratulatory ego trip using brand name recognition to try and validate itself as being anything more than an unfunny and cynical showcase of mediocrity. Anyway, remember when I said last episode that when Daphne and Fred broke up off screen, Fred wasn't considered any kind of prime real estate by the other popular girls because at no point did they show any interest in moving in on him? 
Well, now that Fred has run into the hot girl brains, the brains outright say it sucks Fred and Daphne are broken up and they're just brains now because Fred breaking up with Daphne makes him prime real estate. I will say it is a little funny that Fred comments that thanks to Velma, he now finds a woman's most attractive quality is her brain and starts flirting with Brenda. And we cut back to Velma and Daphne the next day. However, Daphne doesn't want to go anymore and it turns out Olive has come over because she and Daphne have a date to take sexy photos for a charity calendar. And Daphne was too afraid to tell Velma last night because she thought she'd freak out. Velma then proceeds to freak out. However, just when it looks like Daphne and Olive are going to go back inside together, Velma fakes having a panic attack so she can force Daphne to come with her instead. You know, after a while, you just become numb to the terrible things these characters do because it's so relentless. We flash forward to see Gigi and Norville are also under the boulder and Gigi flashes back to how them being stuck there is actually Norville's fault. Norville is saying goodbye to Gigi after the festival and she tries to give him very obvious hints that she wants him to stay over. He doesn't pick up on it and plans to just go home. However, after getting a text, Norval asks her if her parents' cabin in the woods is free tomorrow, and she says yes, thinking Norval wants to take the two of them on a romantic getaway. We find out that wherever Fred is being held captive, it appears to be underneath this cabin. Fred is getting upset at the prospect of being a brain in a jar because he's not very smart. Brenda tries to reassure him that it's not so bad and they have some relationship banter before Brenda gets mad at him for some stupid cliche relationship reason where he said something she didn't want to hear. They're interrupted when they hear Gigi scream. She was waiting naked for Norval to show up only for Daphne and Velma to be joining him. She's obviously upset that Norval has been completely oblivious to her constant hinting at wanting to spend time with him in her cabin which we have never seen or heard about until this moment. And when Velma mentions they're here to find the serial killer, Gigi gets even more upset because she is a prime target as one of the few remaining hot girls. Norville says that she'll be safe because Daphne is hotter than her anyway. Velma and Daphne watch Gigi and Norville argue before Daphne mentions live streaming this is draining her battery and clunkily works in that she's only here to stop Velma hallucinating. Norval mentions that Velma cured her hallucinations. Gigi and Daphne, having had enough of the other two's bullshit, leave the cabin to walk back to town. After they leave, Norval mentions that Gigi was the person Daphne used to be obsessed with, which makes absolutely no sense because earlier on in this series, it seemed pretty clear that Velma was Daphne's first crush on another girl. I might be wrong about that, but could you really blame me? I mentioned in the previous parts that it feels like the writers were spinning their wheels before they got to the main plot of the show and I'm wondering by this point how many passes this series' as writing went through as a whole to make sure it flowed as a consistent product. Because whereas the previous three episodes felt like they were just wasting time and meandering around without accomplishing anything, this episode more than any before it feels like as much plot and story relevant events are being crammed in as possible. I just told you that Gigi and Daphne left and immediately afterwards Norval tells Velma that Gigi is the person Daphne was obsessed with. The next scene is Velma leaving the cabin to run after them and then this happens. What's going on here? Velma, stop! Gigi said there was a cave down in that ravine so we came out to try and see if that's where the serial killer was hiding. But then the outcropping started to break off under our weight. Ah! The events in this episode disjointedly lunges from one moment to another because the writers burnt up all their screen time with the previous three episodes. So characters in the narrative have to go into a blind sprint to try and cover as much ground as possible so it can get to the climax in time. Weirdly, this is the exact same problem High Guardian Spice had. However, one of the storyboarders commented on my video on High Guardian Spice that they were brought on to work on the final episode and, seeing how many loose threads and unresolved character arcs were left, did their best to try and establish something with the main characters so they had enough material to work with to write the actual climax. High Guardian Spice feels like it crammed all its character growth and narrative building into a single episode because it literally did because someone working on the show realized they had absolutely nothing to work with otherwise. And as I keep saying, 
Velma is a show made by industry professionals who have had extensive work in the landscape of adult comedy. They don't have the excuse to be making the same mistakes as the show cobbled together as a first-time project by artists hired off Twitter. Anyway, they fall into the ravine and get trapped by the boulder. This happens at the 14-minute mark in a 24-minute episode, and literally only the last minute and a half explained why the characters are in this situation. All the flashbacks leading up to this point have been largely unrelated teen drama bullshit. And yeah, I get that Daphne being angry at Velma and storming out is how we got here, but does anything in this plot change even the slightest way if none of the idiotic drama took place and these characters just came to the cabin and wandered too close to the ravine? This show has never properly figured out how exactly it wants to balance the teen drama parody with the Scooby-Doo mystery parody. It's made the teen drama so overly messy and detailed, not in a good way, that when mystery related things happen, it always seems coincidental to these unlikable characters making their and everyone else's lives miserable. So now we're reaching the point where the main story is being resolved by things like they fell off a cliff so they can be where the plot needs them to be and the teen drama has reached the point of I recently reconnected with the girl I had a crush on and used to be friends with but I've become jealous after learning she used to be obsessed with someone else that I drove her directly towards the person they used to be obsessed with who is actually the girlfriend of the boy who... You know what? I'm not even going to continue. This is all so stupid. If you're watching a Scooby-Doo spin-off, if you are a person who hears adult version of Scooby-Doo and that sounds like something you would find interesting, are you going to be the kind of person who cares any measurable amount on who is dating who and why? If you are making a Scooby-Doo spin-off, is that really what you want to do when you spend the vast majority of your time focusing on high school level bullshit and you have to constantly make vast leaps in the narrative to get your characters involved in the mystery because you spend so much time just having these characters bicker and fight and make out and break up? Why did you make this a Scooby-Doo related product, Mindy? And don't give me the press release speech about how you always related to Velma because she's smart and resourceful, because nothing about this Velma embodies anything about the original character whatsoever. And even if it did, and this was your mental image of what Velma as a character has always been like, how can you possibly relate to her in any fashion other than if you were a truly horrible person yourself? And her terrible actions are nothing but a justification for your own behavior and absolves you of doing any real self-reflection because you're too afraid of what you might find if you actually analyzed yourself. Daphne says that although she's not obsessed with Gigi anymore, them being in this situation is still her fault. Somehow. I mean, all of this is Velma's fault. Like, all of it, but okay, I guess. I know you're possessive, Velma, but I've always said it's one of my favorite parts of our friendship. Said? Said to who? Was it Gigi or Killer? Yes, I love that. I was abandoned by my parents, so I like feeling wanted. <sighs> Once again, Daphne explains her personality instead of actually showing anything. I mean, you could argue that her calling Olive over to do the sexy calendar photo shoot the same day she and Velma were going to the woods is her trying to instigate Velma. But the way the show portrayed Velma for eight episodes now, it makes it clear that she is completely unhinged without help. So to have something like this be taken as anything other than Velma overreacting once again goes against the rules this show has established. It's not written subtly and thoughtfully. It's playing in the exact same lane it has this entire show so far and insisting that it means something different this time. Also, Daphne saying how this is her fault because she knows how Velma reacts to things sounds a little too much like it's my fault he hit me for my tastes. But since she actively admits to knowingly and willingly instigating Velma because she loves how possessive she is, just makes both characters as emotionally manipulative and awful as each other. So really, nobody is the victim here. 
The only positive thing I can say for any of this is at least this is realistic behavior for someone with severe abandonment issues. To purposefully instigate their partner's jealousy to reaffirm the security of the relationship, which will inevitably cause the relationship to fail at the end. You can't keep your relationship strong and secure by constantly making your partner who naturally has very little security in your commitment to doubt your commitment just so you can reaffirm their commitment to you. Don't do this. Seek help. After all our ups and downs, it felt really good to see you jealous again last night. Hold on. You wanted me to get jealous and rage out? Yes, but I didn't expect you to lie about your hallucinations just to drag me to the woods. What do you want? What do you want? It's not that simple. What it's do you want? Anyway, the rock shifts during all this and Velma says if it can move, one of them can wiggle out. She decides it should be her because suggesting anyone else would be fat phobic. This doesn't work and Norval says one of them will have to get crushed to death so someone else can go look for help. Somehow. Oh! Ow! Gigi, what are you doing? I picked. This is Velma's fault because everything crazy that happens is Velma's fault, Norval. She's right. It's not even an argument. Gigi's just straight up factually correct. But of course, this goes ignored, they all fight, and all together fall into the crystal mind system. Daphne is the one who points this out, by the way, as well as the fact that this is how the serial killer has been moving around town, which I didn't know was a mystery that needed solving, but you sure as heck solved it. But even when falling into a cave system after almost getting crushed to death while on the hunt for a serial killer, we are still not free of teen drama relationship nonsense. Norval and Gigi go to leave, Velma says she and Daphne need to talk about the relationship, and Daphne wants to know why nobody's talking about the fact that the US government sort of recently admitted aliens are real. We cut to Fred, who is having relationship problems with the three brains, as he keeps cheating on whichever one he's supposed to be dating. This show is my own circle of hell, where every single scene, regardless of location or context, is about shipping fuckery. Then maybe we're both too messed up to be friends. It's clearly not working. I think you're right. This is the first correct thing said about any of this. So maybe it's time we try being girlfriends. Girlfriends? No. Anyway, this relationship drama is interrupted by Fred's relationship drama and Velma and Daphne find where he's been locked in. Or Daphne just opens the door. This isn't a joke or anything, the door was unlocked this whole time and I guess Fred just never bothered to check. The show makes absolutely no effort to frame this as funny. This is just a glaring plot hole they didn't have a solution for because they needed Velma and Daphne to be able to find the brains and Fred. Fred yells for help and ends up collapsing the cave system so their way out is blocked. I was unaware this sheer drop was supposed to be a way out, but Gigi and Norval managed to levitate their way to the top, so whatever works, I suppose. The logic in this show is collapsing in on itself. Velma refuses to leave because she still needs to find her mom before grabbing the brains to follow Daphne and Fred out of the cave but she nearly falls to her death before being saved at the last moment by her mom appearing out of thin air in this room with only one door. Everybody got that? Velma's mom uncovers an unpainted mystery machine to escape in. Whatever. And Velma wants to know all the answers right there and now as the cave is still actively falling apart. Velma's mom tells her just to get in the van and she'll explain later. Cut to the cabin where Gigi and Norval are having relationship drama. But thankfully the earth cracks open and spits out the rest of the characters. Velma and her mom hug and because this show is allergic to emotion it cuts the credits before cutting back to the plot. Velma asks her mom who took her. I wish this show had clearer ways to explain things. But her mom says that she has no memory of this at all and the episode ends proper. So Velma's mom has amnesia. Norval's dad says that according to Velma's mom's chart, she has a mental wall built up to conveniently block out what's happened to her, and if her memories don't return within 72 hours, they'll be gone forever. If she remains happy, the memories will unlock. 
I could ask why this arbitrary time limit starts right this moment, but we all know by now that any bizarre decision this show does is because it doesn't know how to write plot and tries to cover up its jumps in logic with humor to lampshade the fact that this narrative has the structural integrity of a wet cardboard box. Velma's mom needing to stay happy for three whole days is a bit of a problem considering her husband has had a baby with the waitress who now lives with them. So we get a montage of Velma and her friends destroying her house to turn it back into the dump it was before Sophie moved in. Daphne asks Velma if she was serious about the girlfriend thing and when Velma says she was, Daphne says that the brains are holding a welcome home party and she and Velma should go as a couple in a dramatic reveal to upstage them. The upstaging is for no reason other than to be petty. Velma's mom comes home and has a memory trigger after wanting to take her glasses back. Velma is ecstatic that not only does she have her mom back, but the memory thing is working. She decides to finally open up the present her mom bought her all those years ago, revealing that they were nothing but a pair of Mary Jane shoes the real Velma wears. My expectations have been so subverted. You are such an intellectual and well-crafted show. You've completely thrown my previous knowledge about how story structure works for a loop. Truly, this is a mark of great skill and talent to deliberately disappoint your audience with an unsatisfying payoff when they were expecting to be entertained by your piece of media. I'm glad I waited this long and put so much expectation on it. Hey, Fatso! We got your favorite thing! Disappointment! Velma's mom becomes sad when she realizes Velma has grown up since she last saw her and she missed so much of it, which is not great for the whole memory thing. Velma says her mom doesn't have to worry since she hasn't really changed and is just as awful as she was before she went missing. Once again confirming that Velma was a terrible person well before this mystery and she can't blame her terrible personality on trauma. Back at school, the popular girls reject Daphne from the clique because she tried to leave the brains for dead back in the mines and the brains have become head popular girls at the school thanks to pity points. Fair enough. She goes to stand with Fred, who has also been ostracized because he kept cheating on the brains the few hours he was locked away with them. Even the girl who pretends to be a cat won't talk to me anymore. <laughs> oh hey look, it's me in primary school. Daphne says the other popular girls don't get to say if she's popular or not, society's obsession with looks does. Once again, I point to the video previous, this one, or time code if this is the supercut, we already discussed this, as the position of popular girl has more to do with power, manipulation and class politics than it actually does with being attractive. The sex appeal part is just one more tool to manipulate and dominate other people by making other girls feel inferior to you and having boys desperate to get a chance at banging you. It's not the dual end all to being popular. Velma interrupts Norville's fencing tournament to ask him to fake a report card for her so she can lie to her mom about how good her grades have been since she was gone. Later that evening, Norval hands it over to her, but they run into Sophie, who came back to the house to get the baby's blanket. The noise causes Velma's mom and dad to come see what's going on, and Velma in a blind panic lies and says the baby is actually hers and the father is Norval. All this causes Velma's mom to faint. When she comes to, she says she didn't actually faint because her 15-year-old daughter had a baby, but because she had another memory of when she was investigating the Joneses manor. She found out in Edna Pardue's journals that there's a secret entrance to the bricked up lab through the well in the garden. Velma's mom also says that although she's not happy Velma had a baby, it's better than her husband cheating on her and she thinks Norville is a good dad. I'm a teddy bear. I'm named after Theodore Roosevelt, a wealthy demagogue who massacred indigenous people in the name of imperialism. Velma's mom still wants to know why Sophie is here and Velma lies again that Sophie is her boss at the malt shop and they paid her a lot of money to watch the baby while Velma's mom was in hospital. But now that she's home, Velma and Norville have to pretend to be Amanda's parents and actually look after her. The next day, Daphne shows up at Velma's house to let her know they can't go to the party and she runs into Velma's mom. Velma explains to Daphne that she's pretending to be in a relationship with Norville and they had a baby together, which gives Daphne an idea on how to be popular again and she runs off. You might have noticed that Gigi has conveniently been absent so far this entire episode. Or rather, she's not been absent, she's been regressed to being a background popular girl for Daphne's B-plot, so she doesn't get in the way of the Velma pretending to be a mom A-plot, because having Gigi be upset about Norville's involvement would be inconvenient to this episode's narrative. Daphne goes to Fred's house and points out they were always more popular as a couple. 
So if they get back together in a big dramatic public reunion, it should be juicy enough at school to make them both popular again. Fred's mom agrees that that sounds like an excellent plan and laments that Fred doesn't have the same mind for petty manipulation that Daphne does. They arrive at school together and immediately get everybody talking about it. We get a montage of Velma being a horrible parent and constantly trying to bum the baby off onto everyone else around her, and Daphne and Fred staging various dramatic couple interactions at school for people to post to social media. Norval tells Velma to change Amanda's nappy while he forges a school headline about her, and Velma goes to find Norval's dad who is the school guidance counselor. He isn't in his office, but while she's there, she finds the outfit the serial killer has been using in a box beside the desk. Hello, Velma. Has your mother regained her memory yet? Norville, what are you doing? Your mother's about to steal all of your grain. Wait, what happened? We cut from Velma getting caught by Norville's dad with no way to escape, and the very next scene is Norval's family playing a board game together before a SWAT team bursts in because Velma called the cops. What just happened? Listen, I can't play the entire clip because of copyright, but here is the sequence of events. Velma comes into the office, she finds the welder's masks, Norval's dad walks in on her, cut to black, Norval's family is playing Monopoly, a SWAT team bursts in, and Velma demands to know why he has a welder's mask in his office. What the hell happened here? Seriously? How many writing passes did this episode go through? Because this feels like... You know what, no. This doesn't even feel like a first draft. This feels like a first draft where you write these two scenes but leave blank the part where they connect because you'll get back to writing that part later and then never come back to it. I have never seen a sequence of events this badly botched in an animated show before. The absolute lack of care and thought that these writers put into the supposed ego trip of a passion project is next level in how negligent it is. Did anyone on the writing team care about the show at all? Not even Mindy? The person who made this entire show just to stroke her already inflated ego? I'm trying to think of something else I can compare this to, but I am genuinely drawing a blank. This is the kind of shit that set Kathy Bates into a frenzy in misery. He didn't get out of the cock the duty car! The absolute level of contempt the show writers have for their own work is so beyond shocking to me. If you hate this show so much, then why are you making it? So Mindy can parade around and soak up all the automatic brownie points for making a cartoon with queer multiracial characters? Mindy's way of talking about the show and her constant insistence that it's very important that people know Velma is Indian, or in Mindy's words, South Asian, and that's why so many people hate it, 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 it keeps reminding me of someone like, I don't know, like Amberlynn Reed, I guess, who will make up like fake medical diagnoses, especially when someone else is going through something serious, just because they can't stand of not being the center of attention. Like, it's giving the same energy as that. I'm, I'm not sure if you understand what I mean, but th that's what it's reminding me of. How this, how people couldn't imagine a really smart, nerdy girl with terrible eyesight and who loved to solve mysteries could not be Indian. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, there are Indian nerds. They, that they shouldn't be a surprise to people. Um, but people are like, no, no, no. I have ASMR. The show was not made because Mindy Kaling wanted to make an animated show about a character she likes. This show was made because Mindy wanted attention and accolades for being so brave to have made something featuring POC characters who are queer using a brand that has recognition value and she had no real interest in the condition of the final product, as long as it got her attention. Doesn't matter if the attention was good or bad, as long as it reinforced her idea that she is a progressive forward-thinking individual who is a martyr in the face of prejudice, and she gets to do so by exerting her power as a producer by making the main character a self-insert, something she has a pattern of doing in the shows she's been involved with. As an Indian loser with cystic acne, sweaty armpits, and glasses. But with one lazy procedure, an Accutane prescription, and medical grade Botox injected into my armpits. Mindy Kaling, just because you are an Indian loser does not mean Indians are losers. It's it every day. At this point, you're genuinely doing more harm than good. Like, 
One critical detail, which I haven't found room to mention yet, is the reason Scooby-Doo is not in this show. The official story given by show writer Charlie Grandy is that they couldn't figure out how to do an adult cartoon with a talking dog and make it funny. Grabby, no. I told you, no urinating on deck. It was an accident! You were marking your territory. You don't have a stroke for this job, Polly! <laughs> but this is not the actual reason. The real reason Scooby-Doo is not in this show is because Warner Brothers did not want the character who is massively popular with children having its brand sullied by associating him with an adult cartoon. Similar to how Disneyland no longer has the hyperspace hoopla event since the new Star Wars movies and TV show became a thing because they felt that the hyperspace hoopla would somehow damage the Star Wars brand. <laughs> What's interesting to me is Warner Brothers had no problem with Scooby-Doo being in Supernatural, but most likely because there was a large emphasis on how much the original show and its characters held a sentimental place in so many people's hearts, and all the characters were presented as true to their original personalities as possible. Anyway, after being told no by Warner Brothers, Charlie Grandy's official reason for not having Scooby-Doo and Velma was, we couldn't figure out a way to make him funny and that having a cartoon dog in the show automatically would make it for kids. Turning this into something being wrong with the character and not the writing. And a detail I find interesting is that after this rejection, Charlie Grandy refers to Scooby-Doo as the dog while explaining this in an interview. This might have been said as a joke and the tone didn't carry through into text, but it still stuck out to me. I don't want to say that it automatically means anything, it's just, I was reading the interview and seeing Charlie Grandy refer to Scooby-Doo as the dog while specifically speaking how they weren't allowed to use him in this show, I don't know, it might be nothing, but it stuck out, <laughs> it, it, it stuck out. Oh, but guess what, Scooby-Doo is in the show. In episode 7, when we pan down from Gigi's cabin to the underground mind, there's this. A silly tongue-in-cheek mean-spirited joke? Or Charlie Grandy purposefully going against Warner Brothers' hard no to be spiteful? You be the judge. The level of ego on display here is truly staggering. But really, is this level of narcissistic rage and misuse of power really that shocking by this point? Um, tell anyone and you're fired. Anyway, Norval's dad crafted a sword for Norval's birthday, so none of this meant anything anyway. Daphne and Fred have managed to regain their level of popularity and they get invited to the Brains' party that evening. However, Daphne is still planning to show up with Velma as her date in a dramatic reveal that they're a couple now. Fred's mom talks Daphne into not going through with it and keeping up the fake relationship with Fred until she's popular enough to do whatever she wants and get away with it like Chick-fil-A. This is just more stupid forced in topical throwaway lines, so even though I fully agree with the sentiment here, I still hate this writing. I have a terrifying prophecy that when the second season of this show comes out, a very large section of its writing is going to be dedicated to making offhanded jokes about how hated the first season was by racist, bigoted man babies. Like, I can already see the kind of humor season two is going to have to like, snidey, snippy remarks about how the first season was received and spinning it into being criticism only made by, like, that character in that one Powerpuff Girls episode. <laughs> that It's going to happen, mark my words. That is going to be a big part of season two. I can see it now. Fred's mom tells Daphne if she's this good at making Fred popular again, she'd like her to intern for her at Jones' accessories, and Daphne enthusiastically agrees. Fred's dad overhears this and is clearly not pleased. Norville is understandably upset at Velma breaking the laws of continuity to accuse his dad of being the serial killer. Norville comments that if their positions were reversed, Velma would have left him for dead after his first hallucination. He also tells her she looks bad in orange, but she points out that he always says this when she says something he dislikes, like saying dwarves and elves are the same thing. An elf is a luminous spirit. And a dwarf is a hairy oaf. But most importantly, they are not friends. <sighs> Show writers. Once again, it helps if you actually understood any of the things you were trying to make jokes about. 
Or thought I'd die fighting side by side with an elf. What about side by side with a friend? Norville tells Velma to get lost, and Velma realizes that Amanda has rolled off into traffic and gives chase. Meanwhile, Fred and Daphne are making an impression at the Brains' really sparse and lame-looking party at the malt shop. And Gigi is still here, and not involved with the plot of her boyfriend pretending to have had Velma's baby because the writers didn't know what to do with her. The Brains accuse Daphne and Fred of faking their relationship and tells them to kiss to prove it. Daphne and Fred have no problem with this, but Velma walks in just in time to see this, having chased Amanda, who's rolled here to find her mom. Velma announces this just as her own mom walks in. Since the 72 hours are up anyway and Velma's mom didn't recover her memories, they come clean to her about Sophie and her husband having an affair. However, Velma's mom suddenly finds she can remember who the serial killer is now that she's so relieved to no longer have to be part of a loveless and unfulfilling marriage despite earlier saying that her daughter's teen pregnancy was better than being cheated on. And, just as she tries to say the name, we cut to credits. Halfway through the credits, we cut back to Velma's mom confessing that she herself is the serial killer. Sure, why not? One more episode, let's get through this. Velma's mom is getting arrested for admitting to... Well, I guess it's not really murder, is it? In fact, should we even be calling the main antagonist a serial killer considering they haven't technically killed anyone? Anyway, Velma is upset because it doesn't make any sense to her why her mom would try and continue doing Dr. Pardue's work, although she was perfectly happy throwing Norval's dad under the bus and I can't see why he makes any more sense than Velma's mom. Anyhow, now she's pissy because nobody else seems to care that it makes no sense for her mom to be the serial killer. She gave a confession, Velma. What are the cops supposed to do? Ignore it? Actually, that's a rabbit hole for another time. Has there ever been a confession to a murder that the police have thrown out? I'm pretty sure there's been one where a real serial killer confessed their crimes over the phone and the police kind of wrote it off as a prank call. Like, I can't remember the name or the details, but I am convinced that has happened. It's sticking in the back of my brain. Anyway, sidetracking, back to this awful show. The van gets auctioned off under the illustrious title of belonging to one of America's few female serial killers, which... There's a lot wrong with that sentence, but I don't feel like going on a true crime side quest so late into this review. I'm already tempted to do so, so let's just move on. Norville decides to be awful and not so much make fun of Velma for her mom being a serial killer, but spitefully shoving a microphone into her face, asking her to comment on her mom being a serial killer for the school paper. Velma tries to apologize for accusing his dad, but Norville isn't interested in her apology. Daphne jumps in to defend Velma until Velma brings up the fact that Daphne kissed Fred, so Daphne beats the shit out of her. You know, it's, it's, it's very engaging and not at all boring watching a bunch of hateful and unfunny characters self-destruct on screen when I feel equal disdain for all of them, and as such, don't care if they put each other in hospital, really. <sighs> Velma is mouthing off at Daphne's moms about doing their job to clear her obviously innocent mom. And they show her a video of Velma's mom confessing a second time during a police interview by also providing a motive. The motive being she wanted to put the brain of a popular girl into the head of Velma. Velma says this makes even less sense because her delusion about how the world should always align with her own wants and needs is so strong. Also, Daphne's mom say how Velma's mom is going to go on death row for this, despite her not actually killing anyone and, worse, be verbally hounded by true crime podcasters. I don't know anything about this because the only true crime podcast I listen to is Last Podcast on the Left, and I can promise you they have very little interest listening to serial killers other than to further dunk on them for being pathetic losers with mommy issues. I don't know if other true crime podcasters hound serial killers for interviews or whatever, so I can't say if this joke is just another example of the writers of the show not knowing what they're talking about or not. So we'll just move on. Velma wants to spend five minutes with her mom to try and figure out why her mom would confess, but the sheriff isn't interested in Velma messing up his case. 
Daphne's moms tell Velma the only way she'll manage to speak to her mom is if she gets arrested herself, and because the sheriff is really against Velma and her mom speaking, the only thing he'd arrest Velma for is murder. Why does this show insist on creating nonsensical, out-of-left-field rules to its episodes just so it can have a plot? It keeps doing this over and over and it never makes sense. Oh, we found Velma's mom, but suddenly there's a 72-hour deadline to get her memories back, but only in this one episode. We have a curfew now, but only for this one episode. We're having the hot girls take ugly classes, but only for this one episode. Like, who gives a crap? It's clear you're just making up narrative hooks as you go. The plot to your episodes and hell, your entire show, is so uninteresting and badly constructive, you had to artificially create extra rules just so that there can be some semblance of stakes that you're just going to completely throw out the window by the end of the episode anyway. Hi, welcome to Whose Line Is It Anyway, the show where everything's made up and the points don't matter. We cut to Daphne, who is getting her introduction to working for Jones's accessories. Fred's mom gives her the spiel that although she married into the Joneses, she's the one who helped turn it from a singular store into a massive company. She reveals that her true motive to hiring Daphne is because she could never get Fred to listen to her regarding one day taking over. However, Fred willingly listened to Daphne about becoming popular again. So Fred's mom wants to ask Daphne to get Fred to become more involved with the company and prepare him for eventually running it. Daphne says if she has to spend more time with Fred, she has to sort out some personal stuff with Velma first. And Fred's mom rightfully points out that nobody cares about her bullshit relationship drama. Back with Velma, she's at Fred's place because she needs his help so she can talk to her mom. Norville phones her and inexplicably, she blows him off. Isn't Norville her go-to lackey? Hasn't she purposefully told Fred to leave her alone because he's bad at being her minion and she was willing to break up Norville and Gigi just so he could be her minion again? And now he's calling her and she's ignoring him because she wants Fred's help? You see what I mean about the show setting up rules and then just completely throwing them out the window? Anyway, Velma hears screaming and finds Fred having a tantrum in the garage. He's upset because his mom doesn't think he's fit to run the business, which, again, makes no sense because so far he has continually shown open hostility to taking part in anything to do with the business. The show is literally crumbling in on itself in the final episode. It's the narrative equivalent of that house that Homer Simpson built. Fred bought the van and I genuinely can't decipher his reasoning for it and I failed to hurt myself giving it any more thought than I need to so here's what he says and you guys can figure it out for yourselves. Because all cool fashion advertising for teens is just trashy, pedo-tinged sex stuff. So maybe if I drive this thing around I can make gentlemen's accessories cool and prove to my mom I'm not a joke. Also, Fred says he's sensitive about always being wrong about everything but he has consistently proven himself to be a better detective than Velma. In fact, I have yet to see one instance where Fred has actually been wrong about something that mattered. Anyway, remember how this episode said Velma can only get arrested for something like murder? Yeah, forget that immediately because Velma has asked Fred to tell the police she's bothering him which gets her arrested instantly because… something… something ethnicity. I was unaware that the American police cared about Indian women more than anyone else but sure whatever. Also, Daphne's moms are really happy about Velma doing this for some reason. Velma is given some time to talk to her mom because apparently Daphne's moms have spontaneously decided to be on Velma's side for absolutely no reason other than the writers needed them to be to have any of this work. Velma tries to assert that her mom didn't really mean what she said about putting someone else's brain into her head. But her mom repeats verbatim what she said during the police interrogation in a way that makes it clear this is some kind of brainwashing. It takes Velma a second to realize this but her mom finally manages to let her know that every time she tries to say what really happened, she just repeats the motive. Velma's mom says she thinks she was hypnotized and Velma posits that that kind of plot twist is only something you see in 70s cartoons and that the solution is snapping your fingers. Yeah, sure, I'll give her that one since I think I kind of know what they're going for here. 
But the way this plot point of undoing the hypnosis is snapping is never brought up again. And in fact, makes this entire plot not work. But we'll get there when we get there. Daphne asks Norval if he's seen Velma at school. Sorry, Daph, but I'm just too tired of Velma's bullshit to care where she is. Oh, and I guess Gigi is just not a character anymore. Did she and Norval break up off screen too? Daphne goes to her locker and finds a note in a geode from her birth mom, who has given her the pocket watch she found in the mines. Turns out she wasn't killed by the serial killer, she just got away immediately. The watch is at first presented as an earnest apology for abandoning Daphne, which would be a hollow gesture anyway, if at least a poignant one, but the show is allergic to human emotions, so undercuts this by saying she's giving the watch to Daphne as an apology for stealing $10 out of her locker. Back with Velma, the sheriff bursts in and drags Velma's mom away so she can go to death row. Velma yells at him that her mom was hypnotized and the serial killer is still loose just as Daphne arrives. Her mom's having let her in. She shows Velma the pocket watch. Velma comments she's seen it before and suddenly has a panic attack and they play that same clip of Mindy Kaling being unable to sell a scream. Did they have Mindy just scream once and it didn't really come out that well because she doesn't know how to do it and then they just reused it every single time they needed it because at this point it sounds like it's the exact same sound clip every single time. Velma finds herself in her own memories at her mom's van the night she went to go looking for her. There, she finds her younger self being hypnotized by the same serial killer. Meaning, her hallucinatory episodes brought on by feelings of guilt were all due to being hypnotized and not actually real. This is one of the very few plot twists I am not actually that annoyed about. It's a weak twist, but it's serviceable enough so I'm fine with it. Except for the fact that Velma being hypnotized means she should have broken out of her hallucinations the second somebody snapped their fingers, as it is well established that the only reason the brain swapping exists is because the hypnosis is so easily undone. I guess it's very lucky then that nobody has ever snapped their fingers near Velma in the however many years, two, three, whatever, that her mom has been missing. Otherwise, none of this show makes sense. Hey, girlies. Mindy fails to scream again and Velma wakes up. She lets Daphne know the watch belonged to the serial killer and Daphne says it has an inscription on it. The inscription is for the army guy who hired Dr. Pardue to do the brain swapping in the first place. Remember I said the stupid hypnosis thing was actually plot important so I had to mention it? Yeah, don't worry, it's fine if you don't. I fully understand not committing any of this show to memory. Velma says this is a problem because the army guy is dead. I don't know how she knows this. Daphne does some split second changes here where she apologizes for kissing Fred, asks for another chance, promises nothing will come between them, gets a phone call she says she has to take, hears Fred's been arrested for weird sex van things, and then leaves off to spraying Velma with some kind of Jones's accessories as perfume and telling her to let her know if she gets a rash. She leaves in the limo Fred sent and Fred's dad is skulking around. I already used the everybody got that clip. Back at school, the hot girls and the brains are having sexy underage shower time again and talking about some of the TV trope before Velma bursts in. Why is she no longer in jail for bothering Fred? Because the writers wrote themselves into a corner so just decided to throw away that detail because it's no longer important. And before you say anything, my mom didn't kill you and put you in those jars. Well, nobody killed them considering they're, you know, alive. The brains don't recognize the watch and Velma is upset that she doesn't have anything else to prove her mom's innocence. Gigi tells her this is what she deserves for taking Norval for granted every day for years. Gigi then lets know Norval is changing schools because he doesn't want to be around Velma anymore and I do not fucking blame him. Get out of the show while you can, Norval. You're a terrible person, but this can only be a good thing for you. Oh my god, I'm home! <laughs> Velma says Norville would have told her if he was transferring. Gigi says he did, and she's been ignoring him. And Velma goes, I don't... I don't have time for this. I have to save my mom. That's right, Velma. Run. Run away from the consequences of your actions. Run away from your responsibilities. You'll be able to escape yourself someday, I'm sure.
Velma is inspecting her conspiracy wall and grumbles about Norval not being around when she needs him. She groans and decides to listen to his voice messages. She suddenly realizes she has not listened to a single one of these for the past two years and ends up spending the entire day listening to them and suddenly feels bad now that her number one narc supply is no longer around. The very first voice message he sends her complimented her new glasses and she takes them off and realizes that the frames were made by Jones's accessories. She also realizes the flower logo which has never been shown in any of the episodes before this at all is also on the pocket watch and the same pocket watch is in a photo of Fred's dad. Velma gets her dad to drive her to Fred's house and not her mom who is currently sitting on death row because apparently Daphne and Fred are in trouble. So you believing me counteracted that. Same with Norville saying he liked me. I thought it was because he made me laugh. But it was because he made me feel cared for the way a cool ass boss bitch like myself deserves to be. I'm so glad all these fictional characters are coming together to praise Mindy's self-insert for being cool and awesome. As an audience member, this is exactly the kind of vanity project I love watching when I want to enjoy Scooby-Doo. Velma sneaks into the lab through the well entrance, but decides to leave Norval a manipulative voice message about him being her best friend in case she dies, and accidentally ends the message by saying, love you, before falling into the water at the bottom of the well, which causes her phone to die. Convenient. Inside the lab, Velma finds Daphne and Fred strapped down to operating tables along with the serial killer. The killer hears her and leaves and Velma snuck into the room without him seeing her somehow and wakes up Daphne. The killer attacks her but she sprays them with some of the perfume Daphne had which causes the bats in the crystal cave to attack them. I feel like I'm playing Mad Libs trying to explain this. The group ties up the serial killer and Velma does the Scooby-Doo thing of how she figured out who the person in the mask is. Velma says that the first two bodies were meant to frame her, but the third body was discovered by someone else and was to exonerate Fred. I would like to remind everyone that Lola's body was never discovered on screen at any point and was just randomly announced and we didn't even know who had actually been killed until her name showed up on a PowerPoint slide at the press conference. This show is trying to gaslight us into thinking not providing any information about a murder in a serial killer case is in fact a clue instead of just piss poor writing. Anyway, the serial killer is Fred's mom, who is actually the army guy's daughter. So when Velma was being annoying as hell about why the boys in high school don't have to take don't murder girl classes and how the watch belongs to a serial killer so it's definitely covered in spunk and the various other sexist comments, it was all for naught because the serial killer in this case was a woman. So I'm glad all those extremely annoying talking points we were forced to sit through were there for no reason other than to instigate the audience. Turns out Fred's mom wanted to replace his brain with that of someone actually competent to run the company one day. She also reveals that the reason the brain swap plan of the 70s didn't work was not because Dr. Pardue went crazy. The experiment was actually a success, but the army guy tried to take credit for it causing Dr. Pardue to throw a tantrum, undo the brain swap and hide all her work so it couldn't be recreated, so the army guy threw her in the asylum. Fred's mom then married into money and after realizing Fred is an idiot, she brought the mansion where the lab is located so she could recreate the experiments that Dr. Pardue purposefully made unrecreatable to put a smart person's brain into Fred. She kidnapped Velma's mom who had found the journals which were just in the historical society where anyone could check them out and then hypnotized her into rebuilding the lab for some reason. Also Fred's mom wanted to use a popular girl's brain because something something woman as a powerful man running a big company. I'm sure they tried to make this mean something or make a statement about something but it really doesn't. Because I wanted someone like me. An ambitious, status-conscious young woman who could appreciate what she might achieve as the male president of a global corporation. Fred's mom then announces that Velma's brain is the perfect candidate and her husband, who has also been hypnotized, comes out of the shadows brandishing a gun. Turns out he's been skulking around because he'd figured out what Fred's mom has been up to. So even Fred's dad is a better detective than Velma is. Anyway, there's more talk here about how Fred's mom realized that popular white girls wouldn't appreciate the advantages of being a rich white man, 
but Velma would because she's not white and blah 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 blah. You may have noticed that unlike previous parts, I have been more and more mentioning Mindy Kaling, whereas I generally don't talk about show creators that much in relation to the product they make unless I absolutely have to. When talking about High Guardian Spies, I would mention Ray Rodriguez, especially since that show also had a blatant self-insert. Actually, it had two, but by the time the show was being created, it was very clear which of the two characters Ray was using as an avatar for himself more than the other. And as such, Ray's self-insert into High Guardian Spice was more of a secondary character. In Velma, it's not just that Velma is a blatant self-insert for Mindy herself, and being the worst kind of self-insert, where the self-insert is a worse and worse person because none of the writers can speak up against the character's actions because the character is a self-insert of the show's executive producer. It's that not only is Velma a vanity project self-insert, but she also gets to be Mindy's personal soapbox. Not so much of her belief on politics, gender, race or whatever, but a soapbox for Mindy to announce that she, Mindy, is the bestest person ever and everyone else in the entire world have treated her unfairly and how everyone in the world just refused to recognize how awesome she is. And it couldn't be for something like her awful personality. No, no, it had to be something she couldn't control, like her race or her gender or financial status or weight or literally anything that she has no control over because if it was something like her actions or personality she would actually have to take responsibility and change how she treats people i know nothing about mindy kaling as a person all i know is what she said in interviews about how she sexually harassed her male co-star told her crew that if anybody told anyone she'd fire them that everybody hated her version of Velma because of her race and the fact that Velma is a blatant self-insert, as well as the stance that the fictional character Velma constantly takes on how the narrative frames her. I am not someone who thinks that a work of fiction is always about what the author condones or approves of. That's some book-burning mentality. The kind that says that if you write about upsetting topics of any kind, you're secretly supporting them or normalizing them because you're a degenerate and I use that term in its original meaning. And as such, all offending material needs to be burned lest it corrupt our society. In the traditional horror movie, we often saw things from the victim's point of view, but that's no longer. Now we look through the killer's eyes. It's almost as if the audience is being asked to identify with the attackers in these movies and that really bothers me. The type of people who think along these lines are the kind who think every single story is some kind of morality tale or meant to teach you a very important lesson and who think it's taboo to write about any topic that they find uncomfortable or upsetting. Up until now, everything around here has always been, well, pleasant. Recently, certain things have become unpleasant. Which is simply not true. Fritz Lang did not make the movie M because he thought murdering children was cool. Joseph Conrad didn't write Heart of Darkness because he thought colonialism was a good idea. Pretty sure he thought the opposite was true actually. George R. Martin didn't write Game of Thrones because he thought incest was okay. But when the show Mindy Kaling made as the executive producer with the main character voiced by Mindy Kaling, who Mindy Kaling changed from white to her own race, who then spends a large part of the show with the narrative reinforcing people discriminating against her largely because of that race that Mindy Kaling is and her weight, which Mindy Kaling has also struggled with, all the while never calling out her terrible behavior except when it's a joke or for Mindy Kaling's character to justify her actions and eventually be exonerated by the narrative, how else am I supposed to see this but as a reflection of Mindy Kaling as a person? I don't know anything about Mindy Kaling, but after watching this show, I do not want to and I hope never to cross paths with her. Sometimes an author writes about terrible people to explore a dark narrative. And sometimes an author writes about terrible people because they happen to be a terrible person and they lack any self-awareness. 
So Velma agrees to go through with the plan to have her brain put into Fred's body. I am so sick of rich guys like you, not only not realizing how much is handed to them, but still thinking they're the victims when they mess everything up because of their lazy entitlement and fragile egos. So this causes Fred to rage, break free of the table and beat up his dad. Fred's mom runs away. I only said those things to rile you up. I mean, yes, I feel that way, but... No, I'm glad you said it, Velma. Only friends tell each other the truth, and I'm proud to call you a friend, no matter how annoying I find your voice. Wow, I'm already loving our new truth dynamic. Now get out of here, I'll stop my mom. Wasn't the entire point of the show about how Velma is going to show us how she was the one behind Mysteries Inc, and it totally wasn't Fred at all, and how Fred is just some cringe fail lord, while she is the real brains of the operation? Because, once again, Fred is proving to be the base character in the show minus Gigi, although she stopped being a character now that the show writers aren't interested in her anymore. Fred catches up with his mom, while Daphne and Velma escape back to the well. They are cornered by Fred's mom, who managed to get the gun away from Fred by telling him she's possessed by the ghost of Dr. Pardue, and that just made sense to him, so he dropped the gun in shock. See, he didn't even hand over the gun. Writers, you're doing a terrible job of making us dislike Fred more than we dislike, well, anyone else in this show. Regardless, Fred's mom now has a gun and is about to kill them, so Daphne confesses her love for Velma, they kiss with some more extremely awkward animation, and Velma confesses her love back but accidentally calls Daphne Norville. Anyway, Norville then shows up because he actually bothered to listen to Velma's voice message. Fred's mom shoots at him, but he parries the bullet with his sword. It hits a stalactite. Fred's mom calls them meddling kids and then gets turned into chunky salsa when the giant rock falls on her. Like, best day ever, I solved the case! Happy dance! So they all get awards. Fred is pissed at Norval for, you know, killing his mom and stuff, and Daphne is pissed that Velma called her Norval in her love confession. Velma then has a movie night with her mom as they watch a dark, edgy horror origin story movie about Boo Boo from Yogi Bear, which Velma praises as being a good idea, which tells me a lot about these writers' taste. And it turns out Velma locked her dad, Sophie, and the baby out of the house, proving that her reunion with her mom did not in fact make her a better person in any real way. We then have a wrap up with the other characters, like Norval being upset he murdered someone, Daphne finding a meaningless note, which I'm sure is a hook for the second season, which I'm going to bet the writers didn't know what they were actually going to do for the second season when they wrote this part. Fred is sad his mom is dead and is shown to actually have started Mysteries Inc. without Velma. And Velma delivers all her evidence to this… she calls it a case but I'm going to call it a fiasco. Oh, and then the sheriff, I was informed, was supposed to be a nod to longtime Scooby Doo guest star Don Knotts, gets murdered in the police department basement because this show couldn't end without taking one last shit on the original Scooby Doo franchise. And that's it. That is the entire show. You know, I had a lengthy conclusion for High Guardian Spice that was so long I had to originally release it as its own separate video, just because I had so much more to say about its characters and world building. I have none of that here. The characters are all so hateful with zero redeeming qualities apart from Fred and Gigi that there is nothing more I want to say about them because it would mean spending more time with them. And I don't want to do that. I had an entire farewell montage for High Guardian Spice, a show I did not like. Nothing about Velma makes me want to prolong my exposure to it. The humor is badly written and unfunny. The plot is barely held together and most episodes are constructed with no purpose other than to artificially drive the characters towards the plot points the writers want, which is the opposite of how you should write. Let your characters dictate the direction of your story, even if that goes against your initial plan. Hell, did you guys know that Rose of Versailles was originally meant to have Marie Antoinette as the main character? Something you can still kind of see in the earliest chapters of the manga, but Lady Oscar was just so… 
well, look at her, that Ryoko Ekida literally changed who her main character was. Throwing away your own story's rules, setups, and the pre-established personality traits of your own characters when you feel like it or when they become inconvenient is purely bad writing. In the first part, I mentioned how previous adult comedy shows have proven that you can have a very successful and beloved show when all of your main characters are assholes. I've been thinking about this, having main characters be terrible people I mean, and I think I more or less understand what the big difference is between Velma and all the other successful shows with terrible people as their main cast. And this is something that can be applied beyond adult comedy television into any genre of story. In the shows that are beloved that have terrible people as their main characters, the overarching narrative, that weird innocuous thing which conducts the tone and direction of the story, never once denies that these characters are terrible. That doesn't mean it punishes wrongdoing and smites down the wicked like we're still living under the Hayes Code, but the narrative presents these characters as awful and never shies away from the fact that they're awful. And that's the kicker. That's the magic X-Factor ingredient that makes the terrible main character work in shows like Seinfeld and Faulty Towers and Always Sunny. The narrative says, this is a show about terrible people. And because the narrative never tries to bullshit us that these terrible people are anything but terrible for the things they do, we as the audience do not get frustrated or enraged or feel like we're being lied to or gaslit. I mentioned the movie M before, which is an incredible film and I genuinely urge you to watch it if you can stomach the dark subject matter of a child murderer. Also, yes, I am about to make a comparison between the film classic M and Mindy Kaling's Velma. The movie M is an incredible study not of a singular person's evil actions, but the collective reactions and inactions of everyone in the town where the serial killer is hunting. We see the reactions from the police, from the organized crime syndicates, and from the common people. We see how the terrible actions of a child murderer brings out to the terrible realities of everyone in town. The police start harassing people and the criminal underground not because they were so enraged by the murders, but because their inability to capture the murderer is making them look incompetent, so they want to present themselves as actually doing something. The criminal underground get involved in identifying the murderer not because they care about the children of the town, but because it is starting to affect their business. The common people get at each other's throats, trying to find blame for how this could happen, desperate to have someone they can direct their anger at, causing arguments and right out fights to break out, as well as accusations and suspicion to go wild. At the end, the child murderer monologues about his uncontrollable compulsion and demands to know from the people of the town how they can condemn him for actions he has no control over, as if they themselves are pure and just. I will davon, von mir selber davon laufen, but I can not, can mir nicht entkommen, muss, muss den Weg gehen, den es mich jagt, muss rennen, rennen. The movie ends with the somber note from the mothers, the only time in the whole movie you ever actually hear from the victims, that the ones at fault are them, us, everyone for not protecting children better. It's a very grim movie with no real heroic characters in it, but nowhere in the film at any point do you ever feel like the narrative is praising the actions of the police or the crime families or the public or even the murderer himself. Even when we hear the murderer break down sobbing as he tries to explain himself, we cannot deny he is telling the truth, but we also do not see him as vindicated or worth forgiving. His monologue is an explanation, not an excuse. The narrative presents a story about terrible people, but never tells you to admire them. Pity them, sure, sympathize with them even, but admire them or even condone them? No. And M is still regarded as one of the greatest films ever made to this day, 
despite one being made in 1931, two being a foreign language film and three having been made shortly after the invent of sound which does result in one or two awkward moments in the film as far as sound design goes. Velma on the other hand is a show where almost every character is a terrible person and even the ones who are not outright terrible they still do terrible things which in any other show would be worth commenting on but here is so drowned out simply by how much worse everyone else is. But the narrative is insistent that we are supposed to find these characters endearing. The narrative insists that Velma is a brilliant but misunderstood not like other girls character whose horrible actions just make her more human and relatable. Likewise, it wants to present Daphne as, I don't know, hot but with an interesting and complex backstory, I guess. It wants Fred to be a straw man for rich white dudes. It wants Norville to be a reliable but easily coerced friend who is just hopelessly in love. And it wants to paint these characters as this ragtag little group of quirky teenagers who are just more real for having flaws and who are also sexy and we get to see make out with each other. It tries to tell us the horrible things they do is just funny hijinks. This is an adult comedy show, don't take it so seriously. It tries to gaslight the audience by showing us Velma being a terrible person and then going, wow, isn't she just the greatest? It really sucks the adults in this show forced her into behaving that way. It's sad that her insecurity over her mom made her use and abuse her friends and loved ones. It's so awful society doesn't recognize how smart she is because she's unattractive, fat, and not white. All the while, showing us characters like Velma both do and say incredibly horrible, hateful shit to the people they're supposed to be friends with. Most of the time without any justification and never showing them do anything positive for each other that could balance everything else out. And as I said, the biggest problem is almost nothing in this show is funny. The constant meta-aware references, topical humor, and lip service to US social issues are so constant, unrelenting, and always delivered in the exact same way in all scenes all the time that even if you did find them funny at first, you get so numb to them after a while that you kind of just go on autopilot. When you hear a character start saying a sentence in a certain way, you already know there is going to be some or other comment shoved in at the end to undercut the dialogue. So your brain just kind of glazes over as you wait for the character to get back to the plot. It causes the dialogue and conversations to feel like someone learning to drive a car and they make the car do this. I'm not sure why this happens, but you get what I mean. Velma is a bad show, and although the frustrating usage of US social and political issues and its handling of race is part of why it's bad, it's not bad because it has these elements in it. It's bad because it's badly written, and that's all there is to it. The characters are badly written, the plot is badly written, the jokes are badly written, and as a result, unfunny. The social commentary is badly written and implemented. Everything that is wrong with this show is down to bad writing. The reason people dislike this show, Mindy, is because it is badly written. So far, I have put in little comparisons and discussions of the characters and how they compare to their original versions, but I haven't said anything about Norville. And that's because Norville literally does not have even the slightest bit of resemblance to Shaggy in his personality or actions. The closest they came to invoking Shaggy at all was having Norville be a streamer who talks about weird snack food, which was a single throwaway gag in one episode which they never mentioned again. The only other time anything resembling Shaggy is brought up is so Norville can blatantly state he hates weed as some sort of joke about him being nothing like the original Shaggy, since Shaggy being a stoner has been a joke for such a long time it's borderline canon at this stage. But Norville doesn't show anything I can even point at as a botched attempt to represent Shaggy. They didn't even try. They took an OC, which has no resemblance to Shaggy at all, didn't even bother to actually name him Shaggy, made a passing reference to weed and food, and then left it at that as far as their fun new interpretation goes. 
Guys, here's my fun new interpretation of Usagi Itsukino from Sailor Moon. Her name is Mindy. She's a stereotypical horse girl who hopes to become an author someday. Also, she hates anime. Shaggy and by extension Scooby are the two favorite characters from the Scooby-Doo franchise because more than any other character, Shaggy and Scooby are the heart of the team. Something I think they might actually have said in a movie or something, but it remains true. You can ask, how do you make a Scooby-Doo show without Scooby-Doo, but honestly, how do you make a Scooby-Doo show without Shaggy? And how do you have Shaggy without Scooby? And the answer is, as Velma has clearly shown us, you don't. Shaggy and Scooby, unlike any one of the other characters, have endured as they are because they are the lovable, endearing core of the entire thing. Shaggy and Scooby are cowards, they like food, they're kind of dumb and kind of clumsy, they're kind of a couple of fuck-ups, and they are best friends who care about each other. We'll never be anything but our old goofy selves. I wish once, just once, I could do the right thing on purpose. I said at the start of part one that I have no personal attachment to Scooby-Doo as a franchise more than anyone else would. But there is a very large audience who are deeply attached to these characters. And it's not some group of boomers who are gripped with nostalgia and hate everything new. Scooby-Doo has managed to be the childhood of every generation that has grown up after 1969, and that remains true to this very day. Scooby-Doo, to this day, is a personal favorite of many children who have no idea how old the cartoon they love even is. These characters matter to people, and they should matter to people. But these characters don't matter to Mindy. Um, and I just, first of all, I didn't know that she elicited such strong reactions. Well, there's your problem, Mindy. You don't even know your audience. And based on what we've got in the show, you still don't. Velma has been announced as HBO Max's most watched series. And this is probably true. But I still cast massive doubt on this. Velma released after HBO Max absolutely slaughtered its animation section after its merger with Discovery. The list of animated shows that were not only cancelled but outright removed and literally scrubbed from the platform is staggering and one of the big reasons why the Writers Guild strike is happening at the moment. So my question is, if you've completely gutted almost your entire catalogue and then released a brand new show in a legacy franchise which you've already instigated your audience over, how big of a win is most watched cartoon on HBO Max really? There is something to be said for hate watching, but I would think Morbius, the all-female Ghostbusters and the live-action Pinocchio has taught us that hate watching can only carry you so far. Hell, not even cats managed to ride hate watching to success and that movie was everywhere when it came out. So although I do understand the damage of a large enough group of people hate watching can have, I don't think that was the case here. I think because this carried the name of Scooby-Doo that people were trying to give it enough of a chance to at least watch it. And the reason it scored so low everywhere is because the large group of people who were willing to watch it did not like it. It's not some vast conspiracy of bigotry or sexism. This show was watched by a lot of people and they didn't like it. Will season 2 be a success? Maybe. It still carries the name of Scooby-Doo so it's possible, but I don't know if it'll get the same amount of attention. Everyone knows it's terrible now. Is anyone going to be shocked when season 2 is terrible too? Would you care if it's not terrible? When it comes out, are you going to watch it or are you just going to wait for a YouTube review to tell you how it compares to the first season? And will those YouTube reviewers say much more than, yep, it's still bad? Maybe it'll do well. Maybe it won't. I'm not here to have some call to arms telling you not to hate watch something. I, I don't think it's that deep. It's an unfunny show that was badly written 
and in time will become irrelevant. That's all. I'm done. What? I'm done finding you. I'm bored. You're boring me. Special thanks to top patrons Trey Windenall, Gunther38, Fulon Cool, and me and my guester. And thank you to everyone who supports the show, both on Patreon as well as YouTube memberships. Ruby Van was found beside a dirt road. Search parties have spent several days searching the woods and found hundreds of Scooby snacks, but no trace of the teenage sleuths have been found.